Welcome, everybody, to Snooze Button? Run Buttons Weekly? Keith, what's going on here? Well, this isn't Snooze Button. This isn't the Snooze Button music. What is... Then what What music is this? This is like a festive Christmas time. I feel so cozy and warm. This is... This is a festmas... Fe, festmas Christmas time music. For a little bit of... Mm. Holiday coziness as we go into our Game of the Year show. I do feel very cozy with the crackling fireplace. Mm. I can't hear that, but I can imagine it, and I imagine that if it were real, it would be nice and warm. (laughs) Well, you heard it earlier, and you just thought I had gotten a very clacky type uh, keyboard. Yeah, I was hearing it earlier. Yeah, I do. Know, I can imagine what it sounds like. Honestly, it sounded like you had gotten a quieter keyboard. Your keyboard now is noisier because I knew huh. that you were looking into getting a keyboard with some linear switches. So I was like, "Is this the new keyboard? It sounds. It sounds very comfort- comforting." But right. No, it was the crackling of a digital fire. Okay, we're here, like we do every year. Uh, I went out. I walked out into the crisp, cold air earlier to wake myself up. And then we had audio problems, and I'm mad again. So it's just like every year. Um, And I guess, you know, last year, last year it was just us. And I said, no guess. This is going to be the shortest run button podcast, game of the year podcast ever. I was like, we're not going long on this one. And do you remember how long we went? Literally, no seven hours we went seven hours it was like the second longest game of the year podcast ever this year it's us again it's a lighter year there maybe weren't that many great you know huge releases so i'm just gonna say if this isn't one of the shortest game of the year podcasts we've ever had then we are incapable of making a short game of the year podcast Fully. If this isn't if this isn't one of the shortest game of the year podcasts we ever had, I'll cut off my pinky. I'll I'll just lop it right off because 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 at that point we've proved that it has nothing to do with external stimuli, and it's just us. It's just us. It's just what we do. And, and in fact, adding a third person and a whole other ten list ten item segment. Re- somehow reduces, somehow reduces it yeah i don't know i think i it's just it it's you and i i think when you put it together we we just think oh it must be linear edition it, it you know it must just be yeah a, a, a game of the year list takes a certain amount of time so if we once we multiply that by the number of people that's how long it's going to take but i think we found out that actually you and i are just a a, 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 a dangerous um chemical mixture that just results in endless talking about video games and i think we already knew that really but it just makes extra sense now well i do have a i do have a twist Okay. I have a small twist that will help make this a short podcast. And okay, what's your extra twist? I can't wait to know about it. Well, this is we call this the game of the year. You have mm. you wrote your game of the decade, but that's not true. That's my well, that's my I figured, you know, it's been a terrible year and we all know why. We know all the reasons. We don't have to go over them. I don't want to talk about it because God knows we've already talked about it on Run Button. That's my only 2020 joke for the whole podcast is Game of the Decade 2020 because, you know, 2020 was 10 years long and we got through all of it. And now we're going to tell you what were the best games of all 10 years of 2020. Okay. I thought that I thought that where you're going with this was that you're introducing a new segment no. Where because this year was bad bad and bad for games, we would just add in a new thing where we t- where we try and t- figure out the best game of the decade. Oh, and was your abbreviating thing going to be you're just going to say no, we're not doing that? <laughs> no, oh, no, okay. no, no. Um it's that I so I was making my list for the last couple of weeks I've been making my list and I was Oh, did you check it twice? It. Did you, I hope you checked it twice. I checked it like 12 times. Wow, that's okay. That's a good, that's a healthy number of times to check a list. Santa. Well, because I wasn't satisfied could, with could, it. And do you want yeah. to know why I wasn't satisfied with yeah, it? Yeah, I, I, could, I could certainly take a, a wild stab at why you weren't satisfied with it. 
Okay, well, I'll tell you instead of. I mean, no, yeah, you can guess. Sure. Why wasn't I satisfied I, with I my list? I would imagine it's because there probably weren't that many games this year that you really loved. Right. And so there's games that I played this year that I had a really good time with. Um, and. But a lot of them didn't come out this year. And so mm. we've. We've in the past, we've, you know, here's what it is. Here's my new decree. Game of the year list, it's serious again. <laughs> Game of the year list is serious again. I'm not putting on, I'm not putting on any, I'm not putting on anything weird. I'm not putting on something that came out three years ago. That's so I have funny. a list of things that I played this year that technically got, got like, you know, quote unquote, re-released on Xbox. Like I played, I just played through uh, Yakuza Kiwami, the two, both of them. And I, I could have put those on there. Those came mm. out on Xbox this year. But no, Game of the Year, it's serious wow. again. Wow, wow, I wow. have five games on my Game of the Year list. Wait, what? I didn't do a list of ten. That's there weren't not, enough. There no, weren't enough games that I... that's not how it I'm... works. You have to yeah. have ten. Well, I have five games that I played this year and, and enjoyed, but that I didn't want to put on the Game of the Year list. And then I have five games uh, that are on my Game of the Year list. Okay, I was going to say, oddly... I had the same thing where I didn't have that many... I felt like there weren't that many games from this year that I really loved and wanted to put on my Game of the Year list. And I would say that's still true, but somehow the more I worked on my list, it became more and more just the games from this year. Um, almost... I And I wonder if it's this thing where it's like, if I put on the games from previous years that I really liked, then they... It wouldn't be fair, or no? I, maybe I didn't have that many games from previous years I was into either. Maybe it just wasn't a game year for me, or something. But I have I a, I have a ton, ton of games this year. I have ten game lists. I have ten game list, and only one of them is not from this year. Okay, they're not um, all bangers. I mean, they're. I mean, they're see, all. That's see. That's what was happening. They're I not had a all list. bangers. I had a list where five game. I had five games on there. Half of the list where I was like, no, these, like eh, these one are of bangers. my one of them, one of my like, lo I had like as my like number eight spot or nine spot or something was Animal Crossing: New Horizons. Oh, yeah, that and might be like, worth putting on because, a list. That's was funny that? for you because you hated that game, right? <laughs> so I was like, there's something fundamentally wrong with this. <laughs> that like, what? It's on my game of the year list just because I played 35 hours of it. Even though I didn't like it, no. Okay. Um. So, I mean, I did okay. like some things so, about it. It fixed a lot of my issues with previous Animal Crossing games, but it's not okay. on my list. Yeah. All right. Because it wasn't one of my favorite games, okay. even though it was one of the games I played the most. Maybe. All right, and I'll I'll tell you um, the anxiety that I kind of have about this year's podcast was that going into the previous two years' podcasts is. is I pretty much knew what was going to be the overall game of the year. Like, both. I think our our previous two... Oh, so, if you haven't listened before, Keith and I normally go through our own personal top ten lists, and then we combine them, we smush them together uh, until we get uh, a, a run, an official run button overall top ten list. Um, and, and then, you know, there's usually, like, with the outro song... I will I'll edit together a little video of the winning game. And like I think the previous two winners we had were Spider-Man and Outer Wilds and like yeah. I'm like already planning the outro videos for those games like before we even did the podcast cuz like I just knew that those were going to be the winners. Uh, this year, right. I have no idea what's going to be. I don't even know if our winner and, is going to be a game that either of us feel strongly about, because I don't know that we agree on anything from this year. To be fair, to be fair, uh, you are not to be fair, to be clear, to be clear, you don't know the winner ahead of time because we've talked about it. You just know. Oh, yeah. I was like when I was saying I knew that Outer Wilds and Spider-Man would be the winners. I just meant like I, I, I uh, correctly guessed that those would be the winners. Um, but I, this year, I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah, I have no idea what our lists, are, what overlap there's going to be. Uh, some years we have a ton of overlap, and some years we have barely any. Last year was a year we had barely any, which is wild because last well, year had I think the like overlap four has been games. I think the overlap has been diminishing every year. Um, it maybe has trended downward, but it's especially notable last year because. Last year we had almost no overlap, despite me having 
for what I would call enduring favorites. Ooh, enduring favorites. Like, How many not enduring just favorites fa- are on this li- this year's list, Keith? Uh, well, it's a list of five, so at least three. Wow. Um, and maybe at, I would say at you least really, two. So how at least are we going to how are we going to smush how are we going to deal with the smush if you have well, I guess huh. We'll just have to I think we'll have to do it in a less mathematic way. You really you you don't want to you don't even want to put on some favorite games from last year you don't want to put no, on yakuza it's kiwami serious now you don't want to you don't want to put like yakuza kiwami one and two at like nine and ten just to be like these games slap i like them i can't put them on at nine and ten because i only have five. <laughs> <laughs> oh, i've been misunderstanding this whole time you only have five you couldn't yeah. put on ten if you wanted to well i mean i played like 20 25 yeah. games this what? year. Oh, well, you didn't like Satisfactory? You couldn't be like, yeah, that was a good game. I had Satisfactory on my on my draft list, but I, I you know, I played 25 hours of it. Wow. We, we played it for the We played it once. I was like, "Meh on it." You and you convinced me to play it for a second snooze, and then I spent the whole rest of that week playing Satisfactory like nonstop. Uh, but then Great. I was I had it on my list and I was like, it's not I don't want to put it on a top 10 list. Okay. And so I deleted that. I deleted um uh I deleted uh, Animal Crossing. I moved Well, let's start here. I moved from my game of the year list to my five games I played and enjoyed this year list. Uh uh Genshin Impact. Oh, so you you have a second list of games. You're I just have a favorite you have, year list. You have ten games. You just want to make it clear that five of them aren't good enough to get on the game of the year list. Uh, yeah, they're just games that I played played more of this year and want to talk about. That's okay. All right, so but they're not going on the list. But they're okay. So should I not even put them as a separate list? on the no, list doc i even. shouldn't even be like here's keith's list of games that aren't that are good but not on the list because they're not yeah, on the again, list well only only two of the five even came out this year all right go ahead with your thing genshin impact yep did you ever play any of that i played a little of it and i didn't care it was it didn't grab me and then i was hearing like it's not as good at it's not nearly as good as Breath of the Wild. It's it's kind of boring and grindy. It's very different than Breath of the Wild. It, none, basically, none of it made me want to play it, except that it was kind of like Breath of the Wild. So instead, I went and and started a new Breath of the Wild save file. How and much that, did you end up getting? That did me in, getting pretty, through it. zero. None of it. Like I I went to like I don't know. Like it, it, okay, so you from started the, the from game, the start of the game. Heard someone say it wasn't as good as Breath of the Wild and just quit. No, I started the game and didn't like it at all, and then heard people be like, "You should at but least you wait because it's zero of it." Ah, I'm exaggerating. I just mean okay. like I, I'm saying I probably put like an hour into it, but how far did I get? Like if you were if you started a new file now, knowing exactly how to do what I did and how to where you're going and how to get there, you probably could have just mainlined there in like ninety seconds or something. Okay. Um, but yeah, I didn't. I basically didn't like it at all, and then I had a bunch of people who did like it be like. Yeah, it really needs a lot of updates, so you should probably wait till next year. And I was like, "Good idea," because I want to play Breath of the Wild anyway. And that's, so then I did. That's that. a weird thing to tell someone, I think, because a lot of the thing, because like the beginning of the game doesn't need any updates. Like it's not a finished story, and that's where the updates. That's where you need updates. But mm-hmm. you, it's got like hours and hours of finished, like content in it and okay. that's sort of the problem so so what i'm hearing is we both played genshin impact neither of us put it on our list but somehow this is my fault mm, yes no i okay. just am conf- i just am confused about i was confused about that you played zero of it but also didn't like it that was the part that was confusing me. well because I, I, I understand I was, now here's the thing is i was really wanting to play breath of the wild and so i was like 
should I instead play this thing that's kind of like Breath of the Wild that everyone's getting excited about? And then I tried it a bit and heard a little bit about it. And then I came to the conclusion, no, I just want to play Breath of the Wild. And then I did that. So the thing about Genshin Impact is that it has, it's free, first of all, kind of. It's kind of free. They give you free characters. You earn free money. Love a it's game that's begin- kind of free. It, it, was the, it was the beginning of... It's the beginning of its life, so they gave you a bunch of free currency to to spend on paid characters. Um, But, like, everything about... There's, like... You can sort of make an argument about how well the game does or doesn't let you do... Like, experience its paid content for free by letting you earn in-game currency and just sort of, like, brute force your way through it. And that's totally a thing you can do. But it's just, like, at every turn, their decision to make this a, like, a gotcha game is bad and makes everything worse about about it. So it's like, yeah. they've got this game. It's The combat is fun. The elemental stuff is fun. The story is good. The characters are are nice. Um, uh, and I played like, I don't know, maybe 40 or 60 hours of it. Um, uh, but like they roadblock you into grinding. They say you can't play any more of the story until you grind for like two hours here. Um, yeah, it's it's basically, that was what I didn't want. (laughs) It's it was basically to, I mean, it's to engender boredom. And then to use that boredom as a tool to get you to mm. buy money and then spend that money on characters. Ah, damn, like, I don't well, know why I dropped this game so fast. I should have gotten in there more so I could get bored and then spend money. Yeah. Um, well, that's why it's not on my game of the year list. Mm. It's because it's because the entire spine of the game is yeah. bad. And, uh, and, you know, hey... I, I don't want to get into it because I've already said my piece about not liking this game or whatever. And I already... This is a controversial not- issue. This is a controversial issue. We talked about it on a previous video. I don't want to get into it. I hate Paimon so much. And so so there was also that, is that the main character that you're hearing from in the game and talking to, I c- Again, we could not about stand this. in the I've least. I've got to say, Paimon is not a main character. I mean... She's there all the time. I, I it is like, no, but, not the main character you speak to the most. The main character you speak to the most. As in, who do you speak to? Mainly, you speak to Paimon. She's the main character you speak to. Well, that's I guess this is what I'm trying to explain. But by not having played more of the game, you don't see how that's not true. Okay, well, I did ask people, hey, does Paimon go away? And some people were like, yeah, Paimon shuts up. And then some people were like, Paimon extremely doesn't ever shut up. Yeah, th- those people are wrong. Those people are have got it, have got wrong heads. About oh, they it. have wrong heads. All right. Yeah. Um, Like, again, my stance on this game was waiting till next year to play it. Yeah. I'm just I I'm just saying that you have gotten a lot of information from different people about this game and that it doesn't add up to a working understanding of how annoying or not annoying parts of it are. Oh, okay. But I know exactly how annoying or not annoying parts of it are. And this game could have double the amount of Paimon and still suck because of other reasons. Okay. Um anyway, that's that's sort of the thing. It's got fun it has fun muscles but bad bones uh people should stop making games like this it ruins them i mean it's a fundamental i I, like without even getting into the morality of of uh of like loot boxes and microtransactions or whatever like it it makes games that would have been good into bad games Mm. it ruins them i Mm -hmm. mean it's it's a rotten core at the at the center of a fun thing yeah i mean like impact yeah microtransaction and gotcha mechanics have been ruining phone games for years now and they've just found a new genre to ruin it's it's the open world single player for a decade and been ruining regular games for years yeah okay i mean this Um, this is an extreme example because it's a free-to-play game so right yeah 
So that's that's my that's that's my first one. I, I gotta say, I mean, I played fifty hours of it. The thing is, I kept wanting more of the story, and they kept not giving it to me hmm. because preventing mm. me from experiencing the story mm-hmm. is their main is their tool business to get model. me to spend money. Interesting. Yeah, that part I had not heard about. That's not yeah. very. Appealing. That's what people should. People spend all their fucking time talking about Paimon. They should have been talking about that. Well, I mean, I, I think this is essentially what people are complaining about when they say the game is really grindy. It's just a different way to say that. Yeah, but it's it is not. It's it's like a very specific kind of grindy. It's not mm. like you're not trying to hit level so that you can beat bosses right the the game halts you and says just says arbitrarily you have to get to this level in order to do to do more of the story like it would be different if it would be it would be it would feel different if they said or if you like went to do something what? and just got smoked because you were not a high enough level but that's not how the game works it's it's capping you on adventure level which is just like the experience you get from opening crates and stuff Mm -hmm. and it doesn't have any bearing on your strength as a character right you could dump all your xp into one character and have one uh extremely strong character and they still wouldn't let you go into the thing is Um, that all we had to say about uh Genshin Impact. Genshin impact uh good good game with a bad game inside of it Mm. uh what Hitman a what a it, to, to quote to quote one of the to quote one of the hosts of this show what a pile of garbage is inside of you <laughs> or what a what a box <laughs> what a bark I think you said that to me once you said what a box of garbage is inside of you <laughs> what, um could what I did you do to make me say that to you <laughs> I don't know it's okay. just you know whatever I do all the yeah. normal stuff um uh, can I could I throw in a game I played this year that didn't come out this year? Yeah, sure. That I la- what I played this year was I mean obviously I played Stardew Valley the year it came out and that was on our game of the year list and and we both love that game. This year I got to dive into the the online co op update to that game, um, and I I played through I I played through the whole first two years and saved the community center with two co op partners. And that was a really great experience. So, you know, all the all the great stuff that's addictive and engrossing about Stardew Valley that makes you just want to play it for hours on end. Like, same thing, but your friends are there. And what's great is, you know, you you share money and if you want. You, you can have separate money if you want, but you can share money. And so we got to, like, divide up. You know, it, when you're playing Stardew Valley, you have to manage your time between how much time are you going to spend farming versus fishing versus going through the dungeon and all that other stuff. And we got to we got to kind of focus more on which things we wanted to do. I basically got all the achievements for going through the dungeon without almost ever going into the dungeon because someone else handled that and I focused on farming. Um, and, and that was a lot of fun. And actually, I'm seeing right ne- right here on the Steam page... Just today, they updated Stardew Valley again to now have split-screen co-op, so that's pretty cool. Um, Stardew Valley, still a great game, and they keep updating it. And that's my thing about Stardew Valley. The end. I love Stardew Valley. It's a great game. I haven't played... I haven't done the co-op thing, but I'm a big fan of the main game. Ton of fun. It does... I mean, Isaac likes it, right? You you guys should play that. Play split-screen. Yeah, maybe. Split screen, huh? Split screen. It just added today. Huh. Maybe. Huh. I would, I would do that. I would consider Let's that. See. I, don't love, Here, I don't love split screen. Not a fun way for me to play games. But that's, well, play, uh, that's a, a small, yeah, sure. play that's a online, small drawback. Play online co-op in the same house. Um, there you go. Here's a no spoiler list of some new features today. Split screen co-op. New people to meet. Hmm, anything else in here that looks interesting? You can sit in chairs now. Wow. You can move your bed. Ducks can now swim. That's huge. Hey, Keith. Ducks can that's now huge. swim. That's great. Your ducks can swim this now. This game's been out for half a decade. They couldn't swim before? Well, because they were farm animals. So I think it was like, you know, they were supposed to be hopping around on your farm. But then some people would be like, I have a pond on my farm. These ducks can't swim in it. It never occurred to me. But now that I know ducks can swim, I'll give them a little pond. Fish tanks. A bunch of new furniture items. 
and uh, whatever. So that's the Stardew Valley update that just came out today. Exciting! Monday the 21st is the day that we're talking. So I don't have these in any particular order, by the way. I didn't. I don't know if I mentioned that. But my next one, Hitman 2. Hitman 2? That's not the you Hitman, Hitman 2? game. I remember Hitman 2. I didn't play it except for that one time. How come? Because uh, I didn't finish the first Hitman, and so I got caught up on that which Hitman thing do I play... And also yeah, now and so I so you decided to not do to not play thing. Hitman, and now also <laughs> you loved that first one. I loved that. Well, yes. I mean, I certainly didn't have anything against it. But what was weird is like all of my Hitman fandom came before these new Hitman games. Oh, because part of it was that you were excited to play the new Hitman, so you played Hitman Blood Money again. No, no, is that not what happened? No, it, it was just that like um, I, I think. You keep remembering it like, oh, you were obsessed with Hitman 1, but that's not what happened. I was just way into Hitman before Hitman 1, and then Hitman 1 came out, and I was like, I, di- I, I missed it. I like Because it was episodic, so I sat out the episodes because I'm not interested in episodic games. And everyone was like, this Hitman game's really good. And I came to it late and was like, it is good. And then Hitman 2 came out, and then I got caught up on which one of those two i wanted to play uh you should finish hitman one and go into hitman two because it Mm. ends up having like a phenomenally good like through line plot that's kind of what i heard i mean i guess you've you've played it now i think also partly i was like "Mm, should i save that for a future um run button series because the reason we played we played like the first real level of hitman 2 as uh, for a run button pilot, yeah. it didn't I'm, get pi- our pilot thing. didn't get picked up though. So now no. I'm like, mm. I I think the Hitman streams can be really fun. I am not a good person to do a Hitman stream well, because I want to. I insist on on getting Silent Assassin. Hmm. Where you don't get caught, you don't leave evidence. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have to do that. If I don't mm. do that, I consider it a failure. So mm. every single mission I have, I, I I consider to have completed, has um, silent assassin and mm. um, no evidence. Keith's, yeah, um, Keith's gone down the silent assassin road, and we all weep for him. Uh, but yeah. we could do. I mean, we could do my save file. I'm not quite that strict. I love to get Silent Assassin if I can. I think my thing is like, I pick. I pick like the difficulty setting that I feel is like appropriately difficult and yeah. and faithful to the I Hitman experience. The, I, I play on professional probably. I pick the difficulty that I think is going to be authentic to the Hitman experience that I want, and then from there. You know, I try to do the silent assassin thing. I don't think I very often get there, but you know, that's me. I don't. I don't like to do like the guns blazing thing. But yeah. But if I have to, and I still beat the level, I might not go back and redo it. it I depends. will if I if I like if I if I minorly fuck up, I'll finish the level and replay it. If I um, kill a civilian, or if I kill a non-target, I'll just start the level over right there. Um, like, from the start. Hmm. Um, I'm pretty strict about it. I don't know why. I don't know why I'm like this. So, Genshin Impact I have on here, because I put a lot of time in it, and I really enjoyed it, despite having major issues. Yeah. Um, Hitman 2, uh, basically unimpeachable. <laughs> this is, this is, yeah. I put this, this has been on my game of the year in, in the past. The reason I've been playing it is because I have an Xbox Series X, and there's no Xbox Series X <laughs> games to play. Hey! And so I've been playing... Uh, uh, not that you uh, know it games. from our video release list, huh, Keith? Where'd that yeah, vid go? The, what's that? Where'd our, where'd our Xbox vid go? We made a series, we made a video displaying the awesome power of the Xbox Series X, and our, our viewers... That? You know. Ooh, sounds like something's going to get uploaded after the stream. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, so so I got that. Uh, uh, and so I've been playing Hitman 2, Forza Horizon 4, and Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts. Nice, Those have been my yeah. Xbox Series X games pretty Great. much. Um, and I, I I went through and did a... Did, um, 
I've done almost all of the like uh, post release stuff that I missed, like the bonus campaigns and like new levels and stuff. Uh, haven't done everything, but I've done most of it, and so that's what I've been doing. Just an extremely fun and funny game to do. Hit me. Uh, oh, I, I I forgot one of my. You know, not I don't want to be the the um, world's most boring hitman player if i do fuck up i will spend a little bit of time causing mayhem before <laughs> eventually reloading i i'm not like um uh fundamentally against having fun in hitman 2 i w- i'll but. say this though i'll say this uh people should go check out that hitman video we did i don't remember it 100 percent. i think we had a little bit of problems like because i mean we're not used to uh doing hitman videos but people should check it out and let us know in the comments of that video if you'd like to see us play more hitman because that's probably close to our vibe like we're not we're, yeah like you said we're not like the wacky like really fun to watch kind of hitman players we kind of take it seriously but maybe that's some people want that maybe some people yeah. are like uh oh, giant bombs always throwing soup cans at people what's it, you know i want the serious hitman and hitman 2 is funny even when you're doing it serious i mean it's a hysterical yeah, those, game th- those games have always been silly yeah i guess that's maybe i think like hitman is just kind of always entertaining i don't think you need yeah. to try to make it silly like there's a there one of the um one of the uh like DLC levels that I played was this like island island paradise getaway for horrible monster rich mm. people, uh, and you had to kill two of these specifically two of these horrible people, and um, or three actually you had to kill three of them before they were able to pay for their facial reconstruction surgery to to go back into hiding, um, and uh, uh, one of the one of the like. Um, murder stories i can't remember what they actually call them one of the murder stories that you can discover is that this guy is like a daredevil and he loves to um jet to to water ski not water ski jet ski what is it like a ski do uh (laughs) jet ski yes i mean a ski do sure yeah um uh and uh they took away his his ski do privileges because he's too dangerous with it Call, please, and so you give me, it back uh, you, you you get the keys me? give it back to him excuse and, me uh, Key, yeah uh formal request please yeah uh don't say ski do anymore why is that it just it it skeeves me out okay. i get i get a, i get kind of skeeved dude by it you're you're saying i must ski don't <laughs> exactly ski don't please um, only only refer to it as jet skiing from now on thank you so you, you have to find the you have to get the jet the jet ski keys back to this guy, give it to him, and then he goes on it, and then you can kill him while he's on the jet ski, make it look like an accident. Classic hitman scenario. Classic hitman stuff. Uh, oh, uh, I think but, I saw this video that you're are you about to describe a thing you did? Yeah. I yeah, saw so this I thing. Had, <laughs> I think it was like a coconut or something. Or no, it was a it was a marble. So like Anything you can pick up and throw is either fatal or non-fatal, but it will knock someone out no matter what it is. If it's a, if it's as anything, um, and I think I had, oh no, it was a pearl. That's what it was. I found a pearl, like on the ocean floor, and I uh, before he even starts riding the jet ski, throw it at his head, and the he just like <laughs> goes flying, and the uh, the uh, the ski don't tumbles into the ocean as if there's no water there <laughs> and it's so funny like he hadn't into and by the way into up. water so shallow it could not hide a jet ski if it wanted to right oh yeah 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 it was like in it was in like four feet of water or something <laughs> um uh yeah so it was so funny i was laughing hysterically at this um uh and yeah stuff like that is just in and, and like that's it's wrong like it is not a portrayal of reality i wouldn't i would never want them to change (laughs) this is how hitman behaves ever (laughs) Uh, i think it's perfect Uh, Um, so that's that's on my list um i'll i want to say a game i because it didn't come out this year last year i think i got my psvr and i didn't put on beat saber 
back then, even though I loved it because I thought a lot of the music that was included was like not that hot, and some of the like the note the like the note tracks that were created for Beat Saber I thought weren't like amazing. But this year they put out a bunch of DLC packs um, that are even more fun than all of the stuff that existed for it before. So I just had a ton of fun with Beat Saber this year. I think they're doing a great job updating, you know, they're updating it and they're getting better at making Beat Saber tracks, which is cool. That's all. Good. Good for Beat Saber. Never played it. It seems really fun. It's it's so sick. Like, it, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's silly because it's just a VR rhythm game, but like, it's still so good. It's weird. I don't hear people talk about it all the time. Um, is it just because no one's playing their PS VR? Yeah, but even then, it's I am still surprised when people aren't like I never touch my VR headset. But Beat Saber, but, though, yeah. like I, to me, Beat Saber is so good that it's like that kind of thing. And I guess it's I guess kind of a shame me. that the VR thing was. Oh, you heard about a total a total failure. Well. Here's the thing. This is the confusing part, right? I think it, it... I'm not sure where the failure was exactly, because... Uh, here's, here's what I'm getting at, is the PSVR was the best-selling VR headset, and Sony just came out and said, like, you ha- you, you know, if you buy an adapter... Um, for the PS5, you can use your PSVR headset on your PS5, but only in PS4 games that support VR, and that they have no They're plan... They're not doing PS5 versions of the VR. Right. It, like, someone, you know, I, whatever the statement was, I think a lot of people have heard it by now, but it was something to the effect of, like, do we, you know, do I still care about VR? Yes. Do I still believe in VR? Yes. Do we have any plans to put, P- you know, VR on playstation 5 right now no but i'm sure you know i will probably get back to it eventually something something market realities who knows what the future will bring yeah. something something you know to the so it really which feels is so like- funny when you think about it because like if you look at the ps5 visually in terms of the design of the console it was made to match the psvr headset if you look at the vr headset it just looks like a ps5 that you wear on your head I wonder um, if that was finalized when they still thought that they were going to be doing VR more. I, I I heard, you know, like I heard someone on a podcast say that they heard rumors that that there was a PS5 version of the VR in development. And like as late as, you know, a couple months before the like announcement of the release date of the PS5, they still weren't sure if it was actually going to be released or not. And it sounds like Sorry, they landed on which not. was going to be released. That that supposedly internally they were still working on an update to PSVR for PS5, and we're not sure until maybe as recently as a few months ago whether or not the PS5 VR was ever going to be a thing or not. And maybe it sounds more like not. Here, yeah. so my thing was well, here's this the, is the interesting here's the, thing about it. Be, what's well, I was going to say the the thing about it, you said oh VR was a big failure, and I'm. I, I, it certainly feels that way. Like, not that many people have yeah. a headset. Maybe it's just that there weren't enough games well, that were like lasting, that meaningful experiences. Yeah, I think I think there just weren't enough games that were like lasting, meaningful experiences that you were going to play all the time. Plus, I think you know VR. It is kind of a hassle to set up and use. Like, I, my I, I've said this. Like, my feeling is always when I'm not playing VR, I'm like. Oh boy, getting out my VR headset, that's going to be a whole to do. Anytime I actually do it, I'm like, oh, that wasn't any effort at all. And now I'm playing a very cool, immersive game. This is awesome. Yeah, I think that's something that people that, that, that as a, as a, as a world, maybe just as an American culture, yeah. but I think as a world, or at least as a Western, uh, uh, a blob, mm-hmm. um, we the Western need to culture get blob. Over the idea that having to do something is too much to do. <laughs> like it, it I, I know that this is a is a is a classic bugbear of mine, but the move to Bluetooth uh, 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 headphones is such an outrageous 
thing to me. Like you're having worse audio experience, wor- less functional microphone on a thing that you have to keep charged and that will will break after probably between one and three years and is also probably four times more expensive than the headphones you were using or more. And all for the convenience of not having a wire that goes from your ears to your pocket. Um, I'm sorry. I lost the thread on what you were saying. I was trying to do the trying to do the dual brain thing where I look at the chat and listen, but I, I fucked up and I only okay. Looked at the I will repeat it. The It'll, the w- universal adoption by both uh, cell phone manufacturers and customers of of bluetooth only earbuds and headphones oh because you're paying more money for worse audio quality a worse microphone on a thing you have to keep charged and will break (sighs) for the convenience of not having a wire going from your ears to your pocket what how does that have to do with vr and it's being it's it gets sold on the idea that this is more convenient oh okay gotcha and yeah. so I, I, and it's like, it's like, yeah. When I use, when I use, and by the way, this is a, this is the, this is the thing that should have happened. When I use my headphones, which can be either a Bluetooth headset or a wired headphones, and that's a great way to experience just how drastic the difference in audio quality both of the the uh, the headphone drivers and the microphone are, uh, is to switch back and forth from them. Um, uh, but like, yeah, it's nice to not have that wire sometimes. But wow, we've introduced all of these problems to not have this wire, mm. and it's like you do so much work to. And it's the same thing with the with the. Anyway, just do just do something. Just do just take out the just, fucking headset. It, what does do it take? Something. Or the 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 what does it take? Five minutes, eight minutes to set up the um, VR yeah. thing. Oh, if it wasn't set up, usually I just mean like I'd have to. I, I I would have to make sure it was plugged in right. Okay. I'd have to, you know, I'd probably have to un unplug the cord and then, you know, pull it out from whatever it's underneath and plug Let's it back say, in. Okay, you're sitting on the couch. Yeah. You decide, well, I'm going to do VR. I'm going to yeah. do the chore of setting up VR. How long does that take before you're sitting with the VR headset on ready to go? Could not be more than five or ten minutes. That's such. That's such it's a not, small yeah, it's not time anything. to be an issue. So no, you're right, and it's not. Um, here is what I was trying to get at about so uh, about this PSVR. That's very confusing to me. Is that all Sony ever said about PSVR was that how it was selling above their expectations? Like there right. was no like hedging from Sony. It wasn't like a oh you know uh you know good. You know, okay, strong opening sales for this new platform that we believe in as the next paradigm. You know, it's a slow start because we're starting a revolution. Like, it wasn't that. They were just like, oh, this thing's this is doing way better than we thought. Like, that was their thing. And now suddenly they're they're done with it. It, it, mu- it must have been the software sales weren't, weren't there. Um, it, yeah, it had... So... I think the thing is, I, I cannot think of many VR games that were like, I want to wear a headset for eight hours to play this game because I can't stop. There was, well, there was like Resident Evil 7. Um, yeah. But, well, I guess. Yeah, this I is, don't know. I, I mean, this is part of the failure. I think it's twofold. There's the, there is the prompt, the. The technology to make Bluetooth headsets wow, of, back on Bluetooth uh, available headsets. and affordable is different from the technology and the money to make Bluetooth to make did I say Bluetooth? I meant to say VR. Yep. To make VR heads the VR games Okay. Uh just flat out to make VR games. Like and to make them good. And so I think there's partially an an, an Unavail- even though there was the headsets ready to play games, there were not people ready to make those games. Mm. And uh, there's, a- I also don't think there's a technology to make those games good. I-, I just think it was kind of a scam. Like, not, not 
N- and maybe not not even necessarily from Sony, but Whoa. from whoever convinced Sony. No, okay. <laughs> hang on. Whoever convinced them like VR is ready. No. Well, first of all, so it, this is this is the the problem I think we've run into with with the development of VR. Why are we talking about this? Why are, why are we talking about this during my list of games? I've never oh, played a I, VR game. Basically, I just brought up Beat Saber, and then you oh, said okay. something about VR. I thought this. I mean, I know it's your list. I was just... I had a couple games that I played that didn't make it on my list, and I was just being like, hey, I play Beat Saber. Good job, Beat Saber. You're doing it. Um, Ice Cream Jones says Palmer Lucky. Yeah, that's probably who it was. Palmer Lucky was a scam artist. Okay, Palmer Lucky was. Yeah, sure. You're right, actually. The Oculus... Like, Facebook is so pissed they bought Oculus, and Oculus is so sad they let themselves get bought by Facebook. It, like, it didn't work for either side, I don't think. Yeah. Did you hear about the person who has multiple Oculuses and huh. and is and is not able to use them... Is, is going to be not able to use them because Facebook is requiring you to uh, connect your Oculus to your Facebook account, but you cannot connect more than one Oculus to the same account. What? And so you are not able to, like, under the terms of use, under Facebook's terms of use, you cannot have a second Facebook account. You cannot make a fake Facebook account with a fake name, and you can't connect uh, a, an Oculus to a, a to a, an account that isn't your own. And so if you have multiple Oculuses... A court, you you will be breaking the terms of use yeah, to have I, them both set up and usable. Yeah, I don't I don't know because I I don't think Oculus wasn't tied to Facebook accounts always. I don't think no, this is a new thing that they are and, phasing in. Yeah, and so they've been phasing this in, and it's been nothing but horrible problems for people unable to play games that they bought, or you know their facebook account gets banned and then they then they lose all their games or like or or they lose all their games because they didn't want to put their oculus either they didn't want a facebook account or they didn't want their oculus games to be tied to their real facebook account so they make just like a fake facebook account for their oculus thing but that's against the facebook rules so then they just delete your facebook account and that deletes your oculus account and then you just lose all the games you paid for and it's like such a nightmare but i don't think facebook cares because from their perspective they were like we only spent five million dollars five billion dollars for this company or whatever it was because we thought it was going to get a lot of people to use facebook so you just have to use facebook if you want to use this headset it's it's such a nightmare yeah Uh, i do want to shout out past me for putting on the uh as as one of my games of the year the concept of the htc vive for which i said that uh nothing about the games is particularly Mm -hmm. impressive uh but more the idea of the uh uh the 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 idea of it as a virtual workstation Mm. i still uh, remember you putting that as google tilt brush not the concept of the htc vive uh, I did put the tilt brush. I did mention yeah. the tilt brush. I don't think that was what I put on there, but I think I, I think I put on using the Vive as my thing. Um, uh, but I definitely talked about specifically ha- being in a virtual space and seeing a giant TV that wasn't mm. there. Yeah. Um, and and imagining it as a sort of digital digital workspace, um, which I still think. Uh, is the most interesting. Like, I don't want to play... V- I want to play... The way that I want to play VR games is to sit in a chair or, like, that exists in a space that looks like um, however I want it to look and I had have just, like, a 200-inch TV. Like, what appears to be a 200-inch TV, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I get it. it that, and that's what I mean, like... If you still haven't used a VR headset, try to get your hands on one because it's a totally wild experience. It is, yeah, it's very um, cool. It's just like, yeah, I don't know. It, I, yeah, I don't think it's the jury is extremely still out on whether or not the game experiences you can get out of VR are ever going to be enough to like support it as a game platform. And by that, I mean like. Will people continue to spend hundreds of dollars on headsets for experiences like lightsaber rhythm game and uh, Mario 64, but you're uh, you're a PSVR robot. 
I don't know. Using the Vive was a transformative thing. And I didn't really even play a game. Yeah. Yet. And and I think that that's what's interesting about the spot VR is in right now is I think the people that have tried VR are like, this is definitely a thing. It's not going to go anywhere because we don't want it to go anywhere, but we're not sure where it goes from here because it doesn't seem like the gaming thing is catching on. So is it only yeah. going to be like from now on you buy a Google, you know, you buy a VR headset because you work in aeronautics and then you get beat saber to play on it for fun like are we just in like the the workstation era of pc gaming when like people were playing doom at work because that was the only pc they had access to like i don't know well the problem is that the that the workstate i mean the workstation as i envisioned it with the vibe on my head does I, as far as i know doesn't exist still well the thing is i i the v i, I haven't used a vive still i know that on the psvr the the that I think that is the lowest resolution screen of like the main popular VR headsets, but the resolution yeah. on that thing is totally fine for playing a game. It's nowhere near good enough to make it worth looking through it to see a giant virtual screen in front of you because the reduction in quality is never going to be worth the big silly you know screen you get to yeah. look at because like I think if you haven't done a lot of VR you look at that and go, wow, cool, it's just like a big giant screen in front of me. It's like I'm in a huge movie theater. But after you yeah. use it for a number of hours, you can't escape from the knowledge that like, mm, but it is just tiny LED screens two inches from my eyes. And that's probably not great to look at for eight hours a day. So maybe if I want to look at my PC desktop, I should just take the headset off and look at the monitor. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Who knows? Yeah, maybe they have to. Uh, I don't. I if they also, can ever figure out the how new... to, if they can ever make a VR headset that doesn't ruin your eyes, they'll really have something. Yeah. Um. Not that looking at a regular computer screen right. for eight hours a day doesn't also ruin your eyes. Oh, I just. Yeah, I just heard about. Um. I'm not sure that these exist or that are. I don't. If they do exist, they're certainly not affordable. But an e-ink monitor. Like, if you're only going to use it for writing or reading articles or something so that you don't have the flicker effect or the backlight, it's just like a it's like a Kindle, yeah. but it's a monitor. That sounds I wonder pretty if, cool. Uh, I wonder if having the higher refresh rate helps with that. Who knows? Who knows? Probably not very much, if any. I would love it to, because that's what I use. So. Yeah, I, I would like that also. Hey, Keith, can I tell you something really fun? Is it more fun than me saying the next thing on my list here? I think it's a little bit more fun. Okay. Uh, we've been going for an hour already. Hmm. Just under, yeah. Isn't that really fun? Yeah. Well, you decided ad hoc to add games to my in between, and one of those turned into a 25-minute tangent. Uh, I'm, so maybe that I'm, has something to I'm do with it. I'm sorry for letting you go on a 25-minute tangent. I'm sorry for letting uh, you lead us both on a 25-minute tangent. I believe it was you deciding to add games to my list that created the tangent. It's, well, I'm not, not adding, me I'm not adding with games your to your list. Content. Pokemon Go. Oh, Pokemon Go. Tell me about Pokemon Go. Second summer in a row where I played a ton of Pokemon Go. Wow, that sounds great. Do you remember the first time? Do you remember the first summer of Pokemon Go? Oh, I, of course I remember the first summer of Pokemon Go. I, I think of it around. as I think of it as the summer of Pokemon Go, but I think it's cute that you think that there's been more summers of Pokemon Go. So tell me about it. Well, this summer, I don't know if you remember, but there was a pandemic. I didn't hear about that. Yeah, but it's keep still going. happening. Okay, that's too bad. Uh, yeah, it's actually worse than it was over the summer. Oof. Um... But uh, during the pandemic, Pokemon Go came out, and mm. they said we're changing how our game works a little bit. Okay. To better, uh, to better incorporate right. pandemic life. Right. One of the changes was they increased how long certain items could be used for and how effective they were. Specifically, the incense that lets you like basically play Pokemon Go from from a, like a standstill because it attracts Pokemon mm -hmm. to you. Um, and another thing that they changed was the radius around a Pokestop in order to spin it so that you didn't have to right. go where people might be yeah. 
to reach the the stop. Mm-hmm. Um, and those changes were pretty much pretty enormous <laughs> for my for my playing habits, uh, which is I have like mm. just kind of a route that I would go. Uh, oh. so last last year, I was in my new place. I, I had a route, and it involved a lot of like crossing the street just to hit the, a specific poke stop, and it just made it a much cleaner path where I would walk out of my house down the street hmm. around um, this little. I don't want to be too specific, I guess. Uh, around this little little um, exhibit at the park, um, and like walk down through the park and back, hmm. and I would maybe do that loop like. I don't know, sometimes five, sometimes ten times. Um, and just spinning Pokestops, catching Pokemon, doing gym battles mm. or whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's just like a really... It's still a nice way to wow. do a walk. Um, I don't have... We all know Pokemon Go. It's a known thing. I've actually I, never you know, heard of it, but I think we're going too long, and I think we should just keep going. Okay. Do you want to talk about Beat Saber some more? Uh... Well, no, we already talked about that. Um, next, I have Call of Duty Modern Warfare what? multiplayer. Did you say what? Don't you want to know if I've played any Pokemon Go this year? Did you? A little bit. I yeah, played. I it? played Pokemon Go mostly on one day. It was the special Magikarp day where there was lots of Magikarp. And I caught lots mm. of Magikarp, so many Magikarp, that I evolved one of my Magikarp into a Gyarados. And also, it was a, it, I I took out my calipers and I measured each of the the fin, like the the tail to head length of the Magikarp, and the top fin to the arm fin uh, length. And I found the one that had the best values, and then it made a extremely good Gyarados. Um, and so now I'm, that's what I've got. I've got a big, nice. strong Gyarados and some shiny Magikarp. I already had a Gyarados when that event happened. Oh, wow. Dang. I'm, <sighs> I'm glad for the people. Just like, ooh, I was a little bit sour. I have been working, I have been working for a whole ass year on getting, for two summers, I have been working on getting a Porygon. Wow. Uh, and I caught my Porygon. I think I, I caught a, some more Porygon. I think I have a Porygon. I got a Porygon. Two, then I got a Porygon Z. I heard and about then that. they announced, hey, next month, Porygon event. We're gonna have Porygon everywhere. Um Porygon, one of my favorite Pokemon uh for a long time. It's like it's like my favorite Pokemon that wouldn't make it onto a list if someone said, like, hey, what is your favorite Pokemon? <laughs> and I would say I would say like RK9 and and uh and Eevee Kingdom, and Dragon probably. Knight, and then I might go, oh, and maybe Gengar. And then I would stop. And then if someone said, "Pick one more," that Gengar. might be Porygon. Um, I don't know. I don't know why these kids are so hyped for Gengar. All y'all out there, it? you're just wild for Gengar. Yeah, I don't get you it. Like Gengar, you're just you're. They're all just lapping up Gengar constantly. What I I feel could like you possibly have against Gengar. Oh, here's very what cool, I have against fun. Gengar. I think Gengar. I think ha- I think Ghastly Haunter Gengar classic example of the middle evolution being much cooler than the final no. evolution no, it's the no, idea no. that somebody looks at haunter and gengar and goes yeah gengar that's the one that's my favorite M- mind-blowing to me i can't even i couldn't conceive of it i i mean and i i likewise can't conceive of the idea that you wouldn't want a gengar over a haunter even if the even if the haunter could have identical stats Yes. Yeah. Wow. You're just like, what is it about Gengar? We what's what's it about this this little boy? I think it's a cool design. I like his devilish smile. Okay. I think he's he's fun and bouncy. Um, he's a classic. He's in the he's in the opening to what is it? Pokemon Red. It's in the opening to Pokemon Blue. Well, no, I think he's Pokemon in Blue. both of them. Both of them. Were, I be, were they it's, di- I thought it was different Pokemon. I think or is it's it the I other thought, Pokemon's different. Yeah, I thought it's like one. I thought blue is Jigglypuff versus Gengar, and red was Nidorino versus Gengar. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So in in the opening to Pokemon to the original Pokemon, that's something. Mm, that um, that is something. In the in the first episode of the anime, hey, that's something. 
That's something. And and uh, I and, will give well, you that one. I'll give you the, first episode the of the Clefa- anime. The Clefable fan theory is also very okay, fun. Okay, I'll give you. Compelling. I will give you that it's in the first episode of the anime, but with the little asterisk that it's in the first episode of the anime as a direct homage to the opening of the game that I already gave you points for. So fair. that's fair. Yeah, that's a fair asterisk as long as I'm getting the points. And well, then I mean, you're I, getting like I, I half find points. the uh, I find the Clefable the little asterisk fan theory pretty compelling. says you when you follow the asterisk down to the bottom of the page next to the asterisk it says this is like worth like one third points. Okay, fine. Thank you. Did you hear my last one, or did you talk over both times? Oh, I'm just seeing Lisa Marie Ernst in the chat saying Kylie is correct, Tantra is better than Gengar. So I feel like this issue has been solved. Open and shut case. Who gives a shit? Open and shut case. That was me shutting the case. I don't know who Lisa Marie Ernst is. Don't give a shit. Someone extremely smart. They know Um, that Haunter's cooler than Gengar. I don't know. uh, Anyway, did you talk over me explaining that you talked over me twice? Yeah, I talked over that. Well, then we'll just move on then. (laughs) Well, you said your thing, didn't you? No, I didn't. I tried to say another thing okay, three times. You right. talked over it all three times. And when I called you out for it, you talked over me again. Okay. Fuck you. What? Call of Duty Modern Warfare multiplayer. <gasps> Modern Warfare? The original? No, the remake. The new one. I played Warzone came out this year, which was oh, free. I, I literally forgot they made a new <laughs> Call of Duty called Modern Warfare. I just blocked that out. The yeah the the it came out came out like two years ago or something. Yeah, I know. Um, Warzone came out this year. Their their battle right. royale game. Mm-hmm. Um, and I played that. Uh it basically killed the genre for me. Oof. I liked it at first. I thought it was interesting. Uh, it added some new the battle new royale interest genre to the battle royale genre, and then. I just was like, I hate this genre. I never want to play any of these games ever again. Wow. Um, I tried going back to Apex, and I was like, no, I like Apex more than Warzone. And then I was like, but I don't even like Apex. Fuck all these games. I just just don't like them. Um, hmm. uh, and I know that I've been hot and cold on these. Hmm. La- literally, literally last game of the year. I I did a whole thing about how it wasn't on my list, even though I liked it at first, and then I got sick of it. And then two months later or something, we did a podcast, and I retracted it and said, I'm playing Apex Legends again, and actually I love it, and I was wrong. Well, I'm here to say I was wrong then, and I actually hate it. <laughs> Apex Legends? The whole genre, but oh, yes, okay. including Apex Legends. You uh, so you're just like I hate Apex Legends. Also, it's your favorite. Right it's your favorite th- one, but you're right that you hate that genre. Right. I was right the second time when I said that I hated hated Apex Legends, and wrong the third time when I retracted it. <laughs> and now, so the second and fourth times are right, not the first and the third times. Um. Okay, that's fine. Um. I didn't really play any Battle Royale games this year, except I did oh. play I did play one round of Fortnite and I won. A for Fortnite du- duos um with Lucas and we won and I said I'm quitting while I'm ahead. It was you know a hundred hundred percent my win my win rating on Fortnite, one and one. Or it's one does and it, one and oh. Does it sully this one to know one. that I'm pretty sure that Fortnite adds in, um, at, like total dumbass AI, mm-hmm. uh, especially if you're bad, like a kid might be, and so you probably were first in a in a in a match full of secret bots. Um, I don't feel like that changes anything because I still got the whatever it is when you win at Fortnite. And then I quit forever, so I'm actually great. So Warzone was not on my was not on this list. Mm-hmm. Um, but what what it did make me want to do was play Call of Duty multiplayer for real. Oh. And it happened to be on sale. It was like thirty five bucks. You want me to play thirty pay thirty five bucks for the Call of Duty remake? No way. I didn't and they want were like, you to do that. What about if it was nine dollars? And I was like, Yeah, okay. And uh, I played it and. 
I it's just a it's just a stupid. It's just like a total zone out game for me. I don't know if it's because I'm so familiar with the Call of Duty multiplayer thing. Despite, I mean, I guess I haven't actually played one in years. The last time I bought, the last Call of Duty game I bought was Modern Warfare Two. <laughs> the last one I bought was uh, Black Ops Two. So we're like very close. Yeah, um, that was one that came out immediately after Modern Warfare Two, right? Uh, no, that was Black Ops One. But it went like Black Ops One. And then Modern Warfare three, and then Black Ops two. I think what came out in oh, it was uh, it was no, the another World War two one came out in between Modern Warfare and Modern oh, Warfare two. Oh right, II. World of World at War. Yeah, the one World everyone War, forgets yeah. about. Uh, I what was funny is the reason I bought Black Ops two was kind of because that was the year that Halo four came out, and I basically played Halo four to death and was like so amped up on multiplayer shooter energy that I had time to also get way into Black Ops two. <laughs> yeah. Um that that speaking of, um that's also on here. What is? Uh the Master Chief collection on oh. PC. This is I've been dipping into these as they've been coming out, and I gotta say what a mess of a game! Oh Holy no! Holy shit! Oh yeah, I've been having oh, problem the, the after PC problem. Version. Actually, it's been mostly fine since. Um, it's been mostly fine since the summer, but they had this bug, and I don't know what was causing it. It it was mostly happening on my old computer, so I rebuilt my computer and basically haven't had problems since then. Um, but it would do this sound thing. If anybody's curious, you can look up the. PC Modern Warfare sound issue, but there's just this thing where it makes this horrible, horrible noise, loud, deafening noise, and it won't stop. Could I? <laughs> and it. Could I ask a that? question? I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. If you and I, I'm, I'm not trying to rile you up. I just would like an answer. I just want, I'm just curious. If you already have a version of master chief collection that they spent two years fixing and it's finally fine why not just play that one instead of the pc one that sucks shit i was playing with friends who have it on pc oh, wow wait but it's cross-platform isn't it i don't know but i also was curious about how mm. halo is with a mouse and keyboard oh right uh, which and is good it is good with a mouse and keyboard actually it's immediately comfortable for me yeah, which is funny considering that I've I've spent more time playing Halo than any other game. Mm -hmm. uh, my, if you made a chart, if you made a visual chart of my time spent with different franchises, it would be like, it would be like, uh, it would be like the chart of how much uh, each country spends on its military, <laughs> and, and Halo the is US the U.S. Is Halo, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and and number two, <laughs> like. Uh, uh, Pokemon is China. <laughs> um, uh, okay, I think it's weird that on your list of games you played this year that were good, you put on a game that was to say that it was a bad version. Well, like I said, it hasn't happened since since like May. Okay, gotcha. So gotcha. so like it was mostly with Halo One. Uh, and that came out last year, I believe, late last okay. year. And um, could I ask you how many more games you have on this list of five games? One. One more. What? One, two, three. Oh, no, none. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, you had more to say about Halo? Uh, I mean, yeah, if you haven't played Halo, Halo rules. Get get uh get yourself some Game Pass on PC and play some Halo if that's the if that's your way hey, that you can play Halo. But uh, you know, what's that? Well, I was I was going to say, sure go play Halo, but maybe if you haven't played Halo, check out our Let's Play of Halo. Check out our Let's Play of Halo. That's a great idea. Well, maybe specifically go play Halo multiplayer. Go play Halo's 2 3 and four multiplayer, oh. specifically three, and watch our Let's Play. 
of uh, the campaign. Okay, I think actually you should just play the campaign. I'm not here to try to sell people on old multiplayer games. Uh, it's extremely fun, and so I think I am. I think I'm the one that's been playing it. It's on my list, oh, okay. so I guess I'm trying to sell people on it. Oh, okay. Well, on my list, uh. On my list of games that I played this year that I enjoyed, that list has Halo 1 campaign on it. So I say, if you haven't played Halo 1, go play that campaign. And don't worry, the first level is not its not nearly as good as a lot of the other levels. So get through that first level and then it's have a great time. It's the shortest time. level by far. And it's the shortest level. Uh, so, so get through that and get through that first level and then enjoy it. Yeah, and, and yeah, and put on our let's play totally while you play fine. it. It's fine. It's fine. I just want people to know that if you play Halo One and you get to that first level and you're like, ah, this is that Halo thing that everyone was going nuts about. I don't know about this. Get to level two, buddy. I cannot imagine someone in 2020 deciding to play Halo One and then quitting during Pillar. Uh, okay pillar of autumn that's yeah that's maybe my 2004 perspective on halo one because i played halo one right before halo 2 came out and i played the first level and i was like woof not a lot to write home about in this first level and then i got to level two and i was like okay cool said says i played the first few levels of halo for the first time this year and the first level was the only one i thought was really good <laughs> well that's just <laughs> wild to me okay that's fine i mean i it it that, at least, to me, it kind of makes sense because none of the other levels are even like that first level. So maybe there's just something about that first level that really spoke to you. Yeah. Um, I, I Like, you know, it's just some people like narrow corridors and not much going on. Yeah. A lot of people just like uh, none of the interest, none Another of the most interesting enemies being in that level. the first level. I've, nev- the- I've never what? encountered this perspective. That's fascinating to me. Yeah, I mean, I don't think that the first level is bad. I think it's a it's an interesting and tense first level. Mm. Um, but I cannot imagine having the second level start with the opening up of Halo. Maybe it's like maybe you're not yeah, thinking I, of because in 2020 it's it's it is so not a big deal to have a big open level yeah. like Halo Halo's uh, next few levels it's just as impressive to have a uh, corridors mm-hmm. as yeah. an outside space <laughs> you got to put yourself in the mind uh, yeah. of mm-hmm. that it's crazy that these levels are big and open yeah. like that yeah like they when just I, let you go wherever yeah when i was playing it in 2004 i played level 1 and it was like ah extremely normal shooter level i guess and then played level two and was like, oh, here's something brand new to me. There's right. a, you know, there's a car I can drive around and an AI person yeah. can get in the back of the car and shoot the it's gun also that's on that car. That these people were playing wrong. And so maybe just try playing Ooh, it right. Maybe said should play it right. Good point. Yeah, Seti, play, play it right. right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, Have you tried playing it right and being correct? Mm, yeah. <laughs> uh so now i desperately need to run to the bathroom for a break which is great because we've reached the end of your list thing i'd like to just Hello, we're back from the break. And now, I guess we're ready with Keith's list? Yeah, I'll, I could I could go through my list. Let me bring up the list on the screen. Here is the list. Keith. All right, I got 5. I I have 5, right? Yeah, I have 5. <laughs> I don't I don't put numbers next to them, so it's um, but here we go. You ready for number five? Yep. Microsoft Flight Simulator. Hmm. 
What do you think about that? Love it. Yeah? Yeah, I didn't get to... I didn't play it this year. But I wanted to. No, not at all? uh, No. Um, And that was one that I forgot about until, like, a couple days ago. And then was like, oh, I should probably try to play that. Mm, But I don't have time, and so I didn't. It's funny because you have the flight stick. Yeah. Um, Which I... Every time that I was playing it, I was like, I should buy a flight stick. And Mm. then was like, but that's $300. Well, Um, no, it's only 80 because that was how much the one I had cost. And I looked it up. Was that? And they just, and that was a long time. Well, it was a long time ago, but I looked it up. Thrustmaster still sells literally the exact same stick, except they changed the red plastic to blue so that it would be uh, PC slash PS4 instead of PC slash PS3. I thought um, that we looked this up together and was seeing that they were charging now, uh, uh, like three hundred dollars, like this one here, Thrustmaster Hotas Warthog Flight Stick, two hundred seventy nine ninety nine. Ah, uh, uh, but that's Thrustmaster T Flight Hotas PS four PS five and Windows for two hundred thirty six. No, let me find it. Thrustmaster T sixteen thousand M two fifty nine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I have a Hotas. T flight, I think. Thru- T flight, one word. T dash flight, thrust master. Images. Yeah, here it is. Oh, T dot flight is what I have. And it is sold for. So the only T dot anything that I'm seeing. Oh. Thrustmaster T Flight Hotas 4 for PS4, PS5, and Windows 236. Really? Yeah. Then I why think we did, did I... this last time it came up too? I looked but on. Yeah. They're definitely on eBay for 80 bucks. I looked. Maybe yes. Maybe a used one on eBay is 80 bucks. Um, yeah. But yeah the ones that I was seeing. Okay. I was yeah. seeing ones that people were saying good for like like two two twenty five to five hundred bucks. That's why. And I was just like. Just like no, no way. Well, um, you can go on I eBay. Bought, um, you can go on eBay and get the one I have for eighty bucks. <laughs> um. Well, instead, I opted to buy a um, uh, an X, an original Xbox to USB dongle, uh-huh. and was going to see if I could hook up our donated um a steel battalion controller mm-hmm. and use that because i thought that would rule yeah and i never got around to it cool story so that's how that story ends um but uh, yeah microsoft flight simulator is rad it was tons of fun to do the like like i think a lot of people who played it played it for a little while like did some flying around just some like recreational flying and mm-hmm. had a good time and and quit out but I was doing like the bush missions where you would start in a plane and they wouldn't give you a map hmm. and they just gave, they would give you like landmark directions, like how mm-hmm. f- how a lot of older flights worked. Hmm. Um, uh, no GPS. They, they just say like, go, go in this direction until you see this and then change course to to this direction until you see this. And you, you basically, you'd use, you'd be in a small plane, and you'd hop from these little airports, airport to airport to airport mm. to airport, and it was so much fun to do this. I cannot, I cannot, yeah, begin sounds great. To describe, it was a blast. And then when I was sort of done with that, I did, I was, I was doing the, um, the like challenges, um, mm. and I thought this would be a good podcast game, and it wasn't like. It was too difficult to fly the plane because mm-hmm. I was doing it I, I, basically as real as difficult as I thought I could handle on a keyboard and mouse, um, and I actually also had a controller, so I was using keyboard, mouse, and controller simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I was doing like uh, they have just like challenge, like hey, here, how about try try landing at this really difficult to land airport, and I would I did a bunch of those. And then I did, I think, what was the sort of viral draw of this game, which was go try and find your house. Ah. 
Um, and I did that and I made a whole video, a, a private video for my family, which I can send to you because you count as my family, um, mm-hmm. uh, of, uh, like the area that I grew up and I edited it in Vegas, Sony Vegas and, and like circled all of my like family's houses that all lived in that one area. And it was like, this is my grandfather's house and that's my aunt Dale's house and that's my aunt Joyce's house. Um, and that's my old house. And they just, it's just there. It's just in there. Hmm. And it's like kind of, it's a little bit wonky, but like you can see my grandfather's pool. <laughs> that's wild. It's wild. That is wild. Yeah. Uh, and then I crashed into it. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Great. Um, not on purpose, but uh, I like couldn't, uh, I like, I, I couldn't get a, I, I was trying to like refine it to make sure that I got it on the video. And the only way that I could get close enough was like to cut a wonky turn and was like, oh, there's a the house and I'm crashing into it and I'm dead. Um, uh, I think smartly they don't depict plane crashing in the game yeah. i wouldn't mind well it, it's but. um it, that they never have in microsoft flight sim and i genuinely think it's just because back when it was a serious flight sim they were like we're not spending any time or development resources on modeling crashing because it's not what the program is about right and i think they just take that out every time though i guess yeah they have they have real planes in there i'm sure it's you know uh Cessna doesn't want you blowing up 106s or whatever it is. Yeah. Um I mean, but Ford has no problem with you crashing their cars in No, that's not true. Horizon. No, well, I think they over many years they've Microsoft perhaps has finally worn down the auto manufacturers to some extent, but I mean, it's it's kind of well known that the reason the crashes are so bombastic in burnout as opposed to Need for Speed, is because they're just not allowed to in Need for Speed because wow, they're real I cars. I did not know that. Yeah. Um, I guess it makes sense why in in the Forza games, in the Horizon games, you can like crash at a hundred miles an hour <laughs> into a wall mm-hmm. and drive away. Yep. Um. Well, you can't drive away. You do crash, right? Not in, not in Horizon. I mean, well, if you have in- dam, do you play with damage modeling off though? Uh, so I've I flip it back and forth. Okay, I do have damage modeling. Yeah, no, right now I do have damage modeling. Cause I, you, cause I, you must you like if you have damage modeling, at some point, the, at some the point, model yes. has got to say For- this car won't drive anymore, right? Like that's right. At some point, yes, and maybe there's a little bit of reduced um, efficiency after that one crash. But after that mm. first crash, you get a cracked windshield. Um, you've maybe got like a weird. Maybe you lose a side mirror, but you're fine. Okay. Um, Let me just go ahead and find some new batteries for this headset. And there they are. But, yeah, Microsoft Flight Sim. uh, Total, total surprise for me. Like, it kind of came out. I didn't... I wasn't really waiting for it. And it was on Games Pass. Just one of those things where it's like, it's on Games Pass. Might as well play it. And I played it, and I was just like just like couldn't stop playing it i loved it um it's funny i don't have a lot to say about it because it's just like yeah you fly a plane in it yeah you fly a plane in it there's one thing you do and it's fly a plane Mm. i guess i guess like i do you know if you're all hey if you're already getting uh if you already got games pass or you're getting it because of our uh um, yeah it was free i could have just played it halo uh what's that it was free i could have just played it it was free. You could have just played it. I had um, I had this great. I had a thing. I wanted to do a stream of it. I, ha- I was going to be on camera, and I had a pair of. Remember in Mario Odyssey when you when you can embody those like Moai heads with the sunglasses on. Yeah, there. I had a. I don't pa- know. I had a pair of. I had a pair of glasses that was like. A Mario hat with sunglasses and then a big mustache that hangs down and I thought that was going to be really fun to be like I'm a Mario pilot with a big mustache also the mustache was a little too low so it covers up your mouth which was great because my mouth was gross back then but that's all in the past I got rid of the I kept the I kept the glasses around for a while and then I'm like I'm done well I'm not waiting for these stupid Mario glasses and I got rid of them 
rip Wait, Mario what? glasses. Where were the Mario glasses? Uh, they belonged to Lucas, and I borrowed them, and now they're uh, oh, back with, okay. at Lucas's house, I guess. Okay. Um. So yeah, highly recommend. If anybody hasn't done those those bush missions, they're kind of tough. They go on for a long time, but uh, they're extremely rewarding. Um, there's just like there's just like a feeling of being in this extremely small plane with like I mean literally propelling mm. through the sky. Um. That is, mm, I guess you'd call it romantic mm-hmm. in the in the literary sense. Not not in the you know I'm not in love. I don't want to kiss a plane. Mm. You know what I mean. Four oh six Cessna four oh six. It's not a one oh six. I'm Team Cessna. Um, when it comes to flight simulator romances. Yeah. yeah. You want to kiss a Cessna? Yeah, I... Hmm, 406? I don't even know what a Cessna is. A Cessna 406 exists. Oh, this, it... this is, a, this is a, a, a a manufacturing... 106, 206. Yeah, maybe I'm thinking of a 206. 402? 402... Uh, the the four oh six looks right. The two oh six. What did you say? Four oh six or the two oh six? I said four oh two. Four oh two. The two oh six looks right. Yeah. Okay. I was thinking of a two oh six. Two oh six. Got it. Now we know. Now we know. Now we know. And now we know. Um. So at the same time, and uh, at the same time that I was doing this, mm-hmm. that I was playing this game. I was like, airplanes are cool, engines mm-hmm. are, and flying is cool. Yep. So I was watching. So this game um, is so good, it'll poison your brain into thinking what planes are cool. Yeah. Wait, the game is so good, it'll poison your brain into thinking planes are cool. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I was like, this is cool. These are cool, right? Uh-huh. And in the uh. I can't remember how it happened. Someone linked something and was like, this is dumb. And I watched the video. It was some sort of flying thing. I actually don't remember what the what the concept was. But I was like looking at related videos and I found some guy on a para, paraglider. Okay. Which is an ultralight aircraft. I think it's most people... basically a seat with a fan backpack and a parachute. <laughs> and and you f- you basically sit in this chair with a fan on your back and propel yourself through the sky with this parachute. That's funny. And the video was like, I don't know. It was just some like you know you know you know how you know video ideas like YouTubers getting video ideas. Mm-hmm. It was like flying to. Uh, you're talking okay a fast. Uh, so I'm googling here. You're talking about a powered paraglider. As opposed to regular paraglider, which is just you don't have the fan part, and you're just hanging from a, from a, from a long parachute. Um, yeah. Paramotor. That was that was oh, what they okay. called it. Paramotor. Right. Paramotor. Because yeah. I was um, like paraglider. I've heard of that, and I don't remember yeah. there being a big fan. So involved. yes, it is. It is powered paragliding. Or paramotoring. Gotcha. That was so. That was the. That's that's what it was specifically. Yeah. No. And so I, so it was like a stupid video of this guy who was going to. Who was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna ride this thing to fast food, pick up the fast food, and then eat it on my in the sky on my way home. <laughs> uh huh. Um, and and I was like, this sucks. Oh, it's got this is this, this is stupid that this guy is doing this. And he's okay. like, there's something about being a thousand feet in the sky that makes fries taste better. <laughs> and but okay. then also he was like, the fries are cold, but they're still good. <laughs> and he couldn't get a drink, so his like mouth was like dry <laughs> from eating these cold sky fries. And I was like, this is dumb. Uh-huh. But I just kept watching paramotor videos because I was like, they're just flying on this little seat. Yeah, no, it's I, crazy. No, I love this. I love you trying to convince yourself that this isn't sick as hell because you can just look at these pictures and it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear that it rules. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so 
I basically I got sucked into playing these bush missions where you're flying these extremely small planes mm-hmm. and also watching people flying ultralight aircraft. I saw one this guy was in like he it was like it was one of the ultralights that looks like it's a plane but scaled down um uh to to a degree where it's like oh this is a plane but dangerous this is a small you by the way you don't need like a license to 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 fly ultralight aircraft you can just do it okay there's like a few aviation rules that you have to follow like you're not allowed to to like drop anything that might hurt someone but that's hmm. kind of the only rule um you can't fly at night that's the other like well, big one well I, I, there are still rules about um well, because like I know that like there are rules about like RC planes, so the ultralight shit has to at least follow those rules, right? It's got to be I don't like know. you what can't. Are the, you what can't, are the RC rules? It's like you can't be under a certain altitude above basically any buildings where people will be in them. Oh uh, no, you totally can. What? Yeah, that sounds. One of the main things is like you go up really high and then you come down and you basically like glide across the ground like that's like one of the main moves is like being really close to the ground it's one okay. of the main injuries is spraining your ankle by like accidentally knocking it against the, like a rock that was on the ground Ugh. or something yeah so so, right. watching the, so like this is this, this is all wrapped up with my microsoft flight sim experience mm-hmm. watching this watching people who have planes who's like hobby hobby is like having a small plane mm-hmm. um uh, which is, by the way, a hobby for asshole rich people. Uh, even the even the paramotoring thing is like you're looking at a fa- like thousands of dollars as an entry cost to doing this. Um, uh, and then like you also should take classes because if you fuck up in a paramotor, you could die right very easily. Yeah. Actually, it was it was only last year that like some big YouTuber uh, who I don't know died paramotoring like Mm. literally in 2020 or 2019 or something um uh but like just like what doing thinking about the sky that's what i was doing i was just thinking about the sky oh great i was stuck indoors and thinking about the sky love it for you microsoft flight sim is number five on my list awesome what's your number four crusader kings three the most grounded game hmm the most on the ground game in the world. No game is more on the ground than Crusader Kings Three. Really? I don't know. <laughs> this is not a, I'm not committed mm. to this position. Okay. Um, have we talked much about Crusader Kings Three? No. On the on run on run button. No, I think this is another game that we got into an argument about somehow. I don't think. Do so. Do you have any games on your list that we haven't gotten mad at each other about? Did we get mad at each other about Flight Sim? Yeah, it was like a whole thing. I've just basically been fuming oh, the yeah. whole time you were talking about your fun with airplanes. I'm like, awesome, Keith. Good I for remember. you. Well, this is, I remember now that this I didn't realize that this was a fight that we had until you told me later. Um, what's uh, what's up with Crusader Kings Three? Crusader Kings Three is. Oh, is this the reverse thing? Was this something that oh, I no. wanted to do and you didn't? I don't remember. And flight sim for snooze and flight oh, maybe was it the was reverse? that I wanted to do flight simulator and you wanted to do Crusader Kings three, and I was just like, "Fuck you! We're not do. We can't do flight sim. We're not doing CK three or something like yeah. that." I don't know. I think that's. I think that's what it was. Um. So Crusader Kings three. My only experience with Crusader Kings two was that was that time the very first it was the very first 24 hour marathon that we did which was also only our second ever live stream and uh we tried to learn crusader kings 2 on the spot and then play it which as you might imagine did not go very smoothly no well even knowing how to play i think that the fun of crusader kings especially 2 is how difficult it is to make anything go smoothly right. at all. I, well, it, um, it was nothing went. We just tried to learn how to play it for 20 minutes and then just kind of gave up and went, oh, this is obviously too hard. We shouldn't have done this next yeah. game. And it was very shortly after that that I did learn how to play it, and it became one of my favorite games of all time. Yeah. So how's 3? Um, 
three is different from two in some key ways, I think. It has a different vibe, but one that I really like. In a, in a, 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 it is... If it, okay, if anything, it's worse, but I think it's, it is it is potentially neither better nor worse, just different than Crusader Kings 2. Um, and it's just that between 2 and 3, these are games with different ideas about how much power you what? have as the leader hey, of Keith? your country. Hey, Keith, I've never yeah. heard of Crusader Kings. What even is that? Crusader Kings is a war game... A strategy game um, made by Paradox, 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 right? I don't know. They made Stellaris. They made. Are you? Is it? It's Paradox. Paradox. Yeah, Paradox. Why is this taking so long to Google? And I got it. Paradox. They I was just, just wanted to make sure. Okay, Paradox made this game. They make a lot of games like this. They make they make the Europa Universalis games. I don't mm-hmm. like those games. Uh, when, I uh, what get, is to the, be fair, hmm? I I, and I I know there's a lot here, so I don't want to waste our time with a game that's not even Crusader Kings. But could in explaining what Crusader Kings is, could you also sprinkle in what is the difference between that and Europa Universalis? Because they just seem like the same game to me. Uh, yeah, I absolutely can. I think it's actually a great illustrator if you know, maybe even if you don't know what Europe or Universalis is. These are two war games. I think that they 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 span different time periods. Uh, Crusader Kings, like, famously mostly starts at, like, what, the Battle of Hastings? Like, it starts in, like, 1066 or something, or maybe it starts a little bit before that. It starts in the 11th century. That's when, and then they also are constantly. They also like will add a mode where you can go further back to like, um, to like the eighth century or something. But it's it's a game pretty much that goes from like the the eleventh century and lasts about five hundred years. Now you um, say a war game. Now yeah. I'm thinking about a it's medieval me- war game, and I'm thinking about well, what med- medieval, whatever. I'm thinking about a war game, and I'm like, like Age of Empires? Like, I have an army and a base, no, and then they fight? No. So it's it's actually not, it's not really a war game. It's a political strategy game. It's just that it's, inc- it's, it's, called, cru- it's uh, called Crusader Kings, though, so war is a big part of it. Right. So it is not the focus of what the game will do. When you go to war, you're basically just moving armies around. You, there's no inter, there's no like, there's nothing interesting about doing the war really, um, other uh, than fulfilling the fantasy that we all have of being the commander in chief of a imperial army that will smite our enemies. So this is this is sort of this is sort of the the difference between Europe or Universalis, which I'm not really an expert in. I just played it and it didn't click with me, and I stopped. I only have a few hours of experience with it, and it was from a few years back. And I believe it was Europe or Universalis four. So these are these are both political strategy games, I believe. Um, Europa Universalis doesn't contain the secret sauce of the Crusader Kings games, which <laughs> is. Mm-hmm. Um, seeing people and what they do okay that's in in crusader king or in europe universalis my impression of it anyway is that the people that are important are the are cunt are countries like you're not really dealing with people that much in crusader kings to get stuff done you're dealing with uh uh, council members, lower level politicians, uh, jealous relatives, mm. um, uh, secret plots, um, uh, adultery, um, heirs, managing your kingdom and managing the, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the parts of your domain that you are not directly in control of trying to get control of them or trying to keep them in control, trying to keep your vassals from starting wars with each other, trying to make sure that you have the right knights, uh, you know, to, to wage war with, Mm. um, 
making allies of uh, other countries or making allies of their vassals, trying to um, manage What's a vassal? Religion. A vassal is a land holding uh, a land holding subordinate okay so like so that's it's like the let's the say duke that I'm the of king. this place so let's is say that, that I'm, a the, I'm the king of a i say that i let's say that i have a kingdom and within my kingdom are all these different um uh duchies and you would be a vassal uh-huh. if you are uh, the duchess of a county and I am the king. You are I my vassal. I wouldn't be the countess of a county? I said duchy. Mm, you said duchy first, but then you switched to county and I caught you. Okay, well, then you then give, your, give yourself an asterisk and a third of a point. I got it. Um, <laughs> the... You would also be my vassal if you were the queen of a petty kingdom within my broader kingdom. Ooh, a petty kingdom. And so I believe that you're a vassal whether or not I have direct control over you because you can be a direct or an indirect vassal. So I can tell you what's interesting to me about this game versus something like Civilization yeah, because uh, I haven't played Crusader Kings. Uh, end of sentence. Uh, but I have recently played some Civilization, and I was I found myself perhaps uh, no longer able to enjoy Civilization as a game series, and one of those reasons is that um, it it so like all the stuff that Crusader Kings has with like the internal politics of all these people and their different goals and um Mm -hmm. and stuff is like this is stuff that's all totally absent from something say like civilization where theoretically this is about a civilization and you know like you can have you can decide what the politics of your civilization are in civilization but like yeah when it's a democracy it's still actually an absolute monarchy you the monarch being you who has a hundred percent control over everything your civilization does right whereas i believe in crusader kings as you were saying it's more of like you can't just go to war with whoever you want you have to like convince people that they should go to war with you like it's it's got to be stuff like you have to soldiers have are under is like soldiers are under the command of your vassals and you have to convince your vassals to go to war with you right basically right yeah the, this is a game full of personalities yeah other other states have personalities i have my characters cuz you play you play the lineage of it's i mean i had a i had a whole i was tweeting about this the the on like the different perspectives that you can have on who you mm. play as in this game because you're right that it's not like civilization where you are just a mouse that has direct control over this <laughs> other thing. Yeah. You are I mean I, I the 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 quick version not the definitive explanation but the quick version is that you play a the the line of succession of this country and you lose when you no longer have a line of succession. Like, mm. if your line ends, if there's like, no heir, if the heir is some other family... But it, um, it, it's not necessarily like your kingdom is conquered. It's just like you are you are usurped by someone else who now rules that kingdom, and that's game over for you. Oh, yeah, yep, totally. If you die with no heir, yeah, there's a lot of ways to, to not... Interesting. To like, there's a, there are a lot of ways. It's not super easy to do. Like, it's not, like, uh, it's a, definitely ha- harder in Crusader Kings 3, I think, for this to happen. Mm. But, like, you can definitely die <laughs> and someone else takes over and you lose because your heir was did not take over the throne. What's an anti-pope? An anti-pope <laughs> is when two people 
say that they're the Pope at the same time. Right. The one who the one who ends up being wrong is the anti Pope. Okay. I'm just because as you were saying this, I like Googled Crusader Kings and I just had a screenshot up on my screen and I was just kind of looking at it. And then I yeah. looked over and realized that there was a list of people at the bottom with all had buttons next to it that just said make anti pope. And I was like, what? <laughs> you can make them so, the anti pope? So the the draw of this game, there's there's schemes, there's secrets, there's characters, players, movers and shakers. Uh-huh. Wars, peace, allies, yeah. enemies, love, wow. death. From the opposite perspective, Civilization, again, that's a game that just looks at, say, a country Numbers. on a map and is like, that blob that blob of blue, that's all one thing. It's the blue blob. Right. And, and it sounds like this game is more about the intricacies and complexities of a state. And that's well, it's, interesting. It's, it is that. And that's not, it's not, a, that's not the, that's part of the draw. Okay. Another part of the draw is that by giving different, by, by giving personality and fluidity to the different mechanisms of uh, in, inter and intrastate affairs, it it you get buzzword, uh, you get emergent narratives. Whoa, yeah, what a buzzword! So here's here's like a very basic thing, quick narrative that ties together two two of the big interest points for me in my campaign um ooh did you reclaim the holy land no oh. um actually quite the opposite <laughs> uh i chose so i my character how so oh yeah go how much how does the crusading figure in how much how what is the crusading part so in a normal in a, in most starting um in most starting games you are by default catholic and you can be called and will be called if you are catholic into a crusade which you are obligated to participate right in. and if you do a good enough job participating you will reap uh, the rewards and if you lose you will suffer the penalties that is the that is the crusader kings you are literally a king who crusades unless mm. you do what I did. And what did um, you do? And get instead you get crusaded. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've survived three crusades. I've lost all of them, but I've basically politically weaseled my way out of any real consequences. So from the them. Catholic church is waging total war upon your nation. So my second, my, my original King was the, um, Tutorial King. Uh, Crusader Kings 3 has a pretty good tutorial. It does a uh, much yes, better we job all, onboarding you. We all into remember the game than two. George the Fourth, the Tutorial King. <laughs> um, I actually can't remember what his name was, but uh, I, I, he died, and I took over uh, as his son, and he needed a wife to have a queen to have an heir because that's what you need that's, when you're king. Yeah, that's how it usually works. And and I looked at all the uh, the the eligible matches for me, and I married a French noble. Mm-hmm. We had a kid named Henri, King of Ireland. <laughs> um, and you're, you're an Irish king. I missed that. Uh, so I had two. Basically, you had you also have you know you have skill trees and paths and stats and. And um and traits traits are a big one. Traits are like traits are either good or bad things. And taking bad traits can give can uh, gives you basically gives you points to have more good traits. Um. And some of them are 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 heritable. Some of them you learn base you you obtain based on your education and on what what track you're on. But my first two kings that I played as were like military kings. And my next king was an intelligence king. And I, I chose that just based on how he seemed as a teenager, how his education had been going, which I was not paying attention to. Looked at it and, and was like, oh, I guess this is going to be an intelligence king. I guess that's fine. And uh, and um, 
Henri, the the, the half French king of Ireland, mm-hmm. it, when he was in his mid twenties, the trait was revealed that he was insane. Game ah, oh, okay. <laughs> um, Bummer. And and basically has sort of like a mental break, I guess you'd, you'd describe it as. There's a big text talking about like hearing voices and seeing things and um uh and it was this whole this whole thing and then all of a sudden everyone didn't like me anymore the new king who is now insane mm. um but i decided uh instead of instead of instead of being insane um that he would instead uh understand this as a religious experience break from the catholic oh. church create a new religion based around this great um based or based around this hallucination uh and the rest of my game had, had became about spreading this new religion the cult of the exalted ghost um throughout i didn't finish my campaign because again it's you know hours and hours and hours and hours to finish one campaign i'm like Two thirds of the way through, I think, but I have I have converted mm. all of Ireland, all of England, parts of Scandinavia, and parts of um, uh, like the Mediterranean okay. to my religion. Um, it just kind of spread. Every once in a while, I'll get a pop up, a pop up, and it'll be like like this region of Spain has converted to your religion. Wow, and, the, and I'm like, that's Killing weird. It. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, and so, and, and so that's one of the things is like is like is like converting cultures, um, going to war, mm. occupying areas, making them your religion, and that that brings me to the 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 third interesting thing about the game mm-hmm. ties into this uh, perfectly, which is that it makes you a monster. In the way that a king would be a monster, that right. in a way that being the ruler of a country turns you into a monster. I mean, you you play this game and you just immediately fall into like uh, like breeding statistics and like <laughs> trying to make smarter heirs um, mm. and like like you know. To, you, you know, I had this whole system where instead of... And that's to say nothing of the crusading. Instead, uh, instead well, I was the victim of the crusades. I will, yes, I know. Um, but if uh, you weren't... I, w- w- during my systematic wars to take over all of Britannia, uh-huh. um, I was capturing all of these people in in the dungeons and th- this is great this is i think a two-pronged explanation here of, of what this game makes you do because because this is just what would happen if you rule a country so your your dungeons get filled and i had this system where there's several things that you're allowed to do to um uh, your prisoners, you can you can torture them, you can execute them, you can release them, you can ransom them, you can let them go if they give you a favor. And one of those favors is you. Ha- I'll let you go, but you have to convert to my religion. So I was mm. basically seeding Britain with all of these uh, forced converts mm. to the cult of the exalted ghost, um, and. And it just started to work. Slowly, places started just becoming my religion. Um, That's how it works in real life. Yeah. You just make and, up a religion, it just happens. And so, well, it doesn't it just, it's not that it's just happening. I'm forcing people to convert. True. Um, okay, you're right. And sending them back home. And then eventually, like, you know, you get enough, you get enough mayors to convert because you kidnap them because they're also knights. <laughs> Um, that they eventually just go like, okay, my town is, uh, this now. Um, uh, it, uh, it also happens to be a nicer religion than Catholicism. Um, for what it's worth, I decided to take some, some personal liberties and make it a nice place where they, uh, they didn't, they didn't hate you for a bunch of stupid reasons. And also you were allowed to be a witch without being killed and you were, 
Um, they they didn't care if you were gay. That's a that's a the, you know personal touches because this guy, you know, it's making a whole new religion. I'm gonna get crusaded for it anyway. Might as well make it a good one. <laughs> um, uh, but the other ha- the other side of this dungeon thing is that you just forget to check, and you you go down. It tells you how long they've been in there. Mm-hmm. And I had the system. I was in my head. I was like, I'm going to intentionally let people go. I don't care to make them wait. They'll convert pretty much 100 percent of the time, regardless of if they're like in there a long time or not. But I would go. I would <sighs> get a message that says, "Oh, mm-hmm. someone died in your dungeon." And I was like, oh, there's people in my dungeon? <laughs> and I would check the dungeon. There'd be people. I was like, oh, this person's been here for nine years. <laughs> 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 and it's just like, like, the, it is the, the, the one-two punch of, like, the intentional, monstrous actions you must take to be a successful ruler of a state combined with the necessary... Uh, indifference with which you view mm-hmm. the anyone that is not another head of state, um, and I and I think that that's a, a very interesting thing. This 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 comes up um, in another game on my list, but the the act of making you think like how a ruler might think is impressive, scary, interesting, and educational. Thank you for sharing, Keith. That's Crusader Kings 3. What's different? Uh, uh, we should be done talking about this. What is? Uh, I can do a quick. I quick, can answer that question quick. Quick bullet pointed list of what is different slash improved about 3 over 2. 3, just a couple quick, a couple quick things. I think uh, the onboarding is better. I think it looks better. The UI is cleaner. It's easier to navigate. And also, uh, lastly, this is like a big thing, I think. Um, and if you check my Twitter for Crusader Kings tweets, um, you'll see me tweeting more in depth about this. Um, but there's a difference between uh, what they have, they have a, the, the two games have a different idea on what on how effective a leader is in crusader kings Mm. 3 you are more effective Mm. of a of a of a player in the world Mm. than you are in crusader kings 2 oh so they nerfed it for the noobs is what you're saying um uh no well that's part of it that was my initial take was that they made it easier so it would be more accessible uh but I also think that it might just be true that if you're the king of, you know, a huge mass, you know, like Mm -hmm. if you're the king of an area the size of, like, Connecticut uh, or, like, Connecticut and Massachusetts and Rhode Island or something. If you if you're the if you're the king of that and Uh all of Europe is is what, like, like not even the whole of the East Coast. Right. Uh, Like Europe's pretty small of America. Um, no, we went yeah, over this. Doesn't... We went over this. Europe is about two thirds the size. No, the continental United States is two thirds the size of what is generally considered to be the European continent. No, the U.S. is bigger than Europe, right? I'm sorry, Keith. I mean, maybe if you include Alaska, but Alaska, there's nothing in there. So what are we including? Well, there's not much in Russia either. Well, they that's why that's why the that part of it is left out. Okay. Real country sizes. Classic classic recurring run button segment. How big is Europe? Hmm. I don't know. Well, it doesn't he's, matter. He's still not sure, folks. I'm well, I'm looking at the sizes and it's hard just hard to tell from from this one mm. thing that I'm looking at engagingdata.com slash country sizes uh mercator. Okay. Um anyway. Uh so uh the so however big it's big. It's a big it's a big area in a not big area, right? Mm-hmm. Like I'm the king of all of Ireland and half of um Britain. Right. Okay. Like that's that's a big. It's a big chunk of. You're Europe. right. It is big, but also, 
small. And isn't that but something? But also small. Um, right? That's... Th- that one is that one is very on its way to being an uh, a real recurring run button bit, <laughs> which is the the size of Britain and Ireland. How big is it? Well, it's not so big. It's pretty small, but also when you small, think about it, compared it to so some big. places, pretty big. Pretty big. So how much how much power is a basically absolute monarch able to exert? Is it closer to Crusader Kings two, which mm. feels sort of like, uh, like you like a train on rails, but you have the you're at the switching station, or is okay. it more like, or is it more like Crusader Kings three, which feels like a load of bumper cars on a bumper car track? Wow, which is a lot a lot more control and a lot more individual control, but not it did that, but doesn't sound like a lot more if we're comparing it to bumper cars. Well, no, notorious big, for their no, notorious for their poor controls and constant bumping into each other. Right. Well, that's the that's the war part of the game. Okay. So, so that's the that is like the main. Those are the main differences. Like Crusader Kings Three is a lot more accessible, I think, and and the ways that that is represented mechanically may also. Oh, lend it some more realism in terms of what, like, how easy is it to get people to kill you for you? If you're willing to be an assassin king and pay someone to kill someone else, is that very easy or is that very hard? Hmm. And and Crusader Kings 2 and 3, that's one of the things that they have different ideas about. Gotcha. In Crusader Kings 3, it's much easier to cause someone to die. Right. Directly. I, I mean, I, it's just as easy to start a war and kill a bunch of people. Yeah, I mean, like... to kill someone in quote-unquote important... Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'll have to check it out. I mean, I would be so much more interested in the Games Pass. Oh, that's right. I, I'd be so much more interested if it wasn't explicitly about religious wars. Like you can't even try I to avoid them. I cannot underestimate. Wi- I cannot. I cannot overestimate how little the the fact that there's. I've n- I have never participated in a crusade in all of my time playing Crusader Kings ever. Well, I mean, you did participate in a crusade. Sorry, it's just I was from, the victim of several from crusades. From the yeah. other end of it. Right. I Yeah, I have been the victim of three crusades in my Crusader Kings 3 playthrough. Well, I... But in, in all my time playing Crusader Kings uh, 2, in which I was almost always a Nordic uh, country... Mm-hmm. Um, uh, ...with a pagan religion, I've, you know, I've just never done a crusade. I've never even engaged with that part of the game. Um interesting uh yeah i mean it's it's not even like i guess where i'm coming from it's not even necessarily the distaste for the crusades as much as like the crusades are a very specific event that is i mean i don't want to say unique because like basically nothing in history is unique but like they did like four of them right oh yeah (laughs) yes uh and I guess what I'm saying is, like, the idea that there is an entity that is outside of a lot of people's view of statehood that has this power, that being the, the Catholic Church and the Pope, having right. power over multiple of some of the most powerful states in the world at the time yeah. and sending them to war simultaneously, like, that's a really big thing happening and yeah. and so in, I can see in why it's interesting to make. Me. I can see why it's interesting to make a game about it. But I'm like, I guess what I'm saying is like, I don't think the Crusade part of Crusader Kings would necessarily be unfun. I can just imagine myself being like, I wish I could play Crusader Kings in a time period that wasn't the Crusades, or in a different part of the world. I, I I just I just think that you have a wrong idea about how much the Crusades affects what the game is. Okay. Um, and so if that's your hang up, then I would say don't even worry about it. It's not really a hang up, it's just a thought. Yeah. Um there's there's a lot of ways to avoid the crusades, and again, the war it's there's it's 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 a big nothing in this game. Like you you literally have like a guy on a map who represents three thousand people or whatever, or you know, it represents however many people are are in that area. 
and you move it around like a fucking piece on a game board and the fight just happens, you know? Um, yeah, no. And so there's nothing interesting about any of the wars. And then the Crusades, you know, if you're in one, you're in one out of 500 years of playtime. It's just a big nothing. Uh, and and I and maybe that's a criticism, but the game is about so much more to me than that stuff um, uh, that it like doesn't even register to, to me as a problem that the that the war bit of it is not interesting. But um, you're you are particularly predisposed to be disinterested in the Crusades, right? Uh, I don't know. No, it's it's just not just it's just a zero. It's just a nothing. It's it it feels like it's called Crusader Kings because the first one was called Crusader Kings years and years ago. Like it's just it's it's almost it's it feels like it's called Crusader Kings perfunctorily. Okay. Um maybe I'm wrong. Maybe other people feel a different way about the crusade aspect of it, but I don't know. You should try the game and tell me how you feel about about right. how much crusade stuff there's in there. Number 3. Number three. Blaze Ball. Blaze Ball. Wow. Coming at number three. Coming at number three. I, I was sure. I, I mean, I felt like it was it was maybe going to be your game of the year. Felt almost like a shoe in Wow. Um, it, def- it definitely was possible. I mean, at the end of the day. Oh, well, I got to stretch. Oh, got to do a stretch. Sorry about that. Sorry, folks. Um, I really. At the end of the day, Keith, I yeah. swear to God, could we, yeah. for one year, get through a game of the year podcast without you needing to do a stretch? Like every year, I'm like, this is the year we're not going to need Keith to do a stretch, and then all of a sudden, mm. we get a couple hours in, and now Keith's muscles are tensing up. He's got to pull him around. It's it's bothering so you wanna me. Know, you want to know? I'll, let me shake my let me shake my little uh, magic eight ball here, uh huh, and see if in the future I can we can get through the, a game of the year. This is exact a stretch. This is exactly what I'm looking to know. Ooh, outlook not so good. <laughs> oh, I should just quit now. <laughs> um, All here, right, what do again. you have to say about baseball? Um, what do you okay. have to say about 2020's biggest sports phenomenon? Blaseball. Blaseball. Well, I think that there are... I think that there are a lot of ways to enjoy Blaseball. And I think that that's one of the good things. Is I, I think that different people are interested in different things about it. Mm. Um, and one of those ways is you could be like me, and you could love to watch the random number generator crash into itself. And do weird stuff and to do surprising things and, you know, and and in, and in envision a reality as as presented by the text of the game and and have fun with the sort of randomness and the fun names, but also the surprising plays like, wow, home run right at the end. That's like how a sports movie goes, you know? Um, and that was just a random number generator that did all mm-hmm. that, uh, that that generated real drama. Um, Sometimes and, and it also, randomly generates a boring game, just like real baseball, though. Yeah, sure, but there's, there's not also, always like, an amazing hit. There's also right at the ten end. games happening every hour, right? So you so you get you get the hit pretty often. Um, now, could I ask? Do you? Yeah. Are do we feel like maybe one season per week in retrospect was too many seasons per year? Um, I don't. I don't know. No, it was one per week. Because uh, yeah, whole no, season in a week. They called it a year. No, no, no. I was they saying, per- do we think one season per week was too many seasons in a year? Was my well, they didn't full do question. That. They only had ten. They only had ten seasons or something. They like only that. had ten seasons. Yeah, they've been on they've been on hiatus since yeah. like uh since like September or something. Well, now you know how closely I've been keeping up with baseball. Yeah, so not closely. So asked and answered, you and the baseball developers agree that okay. that's too much and that they should take several months off. All right. Um. Uh. They did a mini. They did a mini. They did like a uh, a special cup 
They did the coffee cup um, <laughs> where they they rolled they rolled new coffee based teams. What? Um, yeah, they rolled a bunch of coffee based teams. Uh, all new teams or just some new teams that were about all new coffee? Teams. I mean, all new teams. Are, do the Moist Talkers still exist, or have they yes. been converted this into a coffee a special team? Cup. Okay. No, no, no. There was a special cup. You know, they took players, they added some new players, and they took players from other teams and created the coffee cup. And they did a, they did the tournament, and they did, you know, one leg of the tournament a week for a month. So on Tuesday, they would have one day where they did a day of baseball. For it, it took a month or something like that to get through, um, and that was fun. And I think that that was too little baseball for me. It was hard to get into it when it was only one day a week um, for a month. Mm. Uh, and so I don't know. I I don't. I was not anticipating talking about the schedule. I I don't well, know I'm, what the I'm right s- schedule is for me in terms of en- maximum okay. enjoyment. Well, I, and I'm- I don't know what the right schedule is for the developers for minimum overwork okay well from um, from now on uh ahead of time you can give me your game of the year list and then i'll respond with a list of things about them i might talk about and then you'll have time to prepare i feel like i, I feel like i answered that question fully uh i mean i i didn't i i, I had no problem with the name of with your answer i just you you said you weren't prepared, and so from now on, I will prepare you. Um, what are the Fridays? What are the Fridays? The Fridays. There's a team. There's a baseball team called the Fridays, and I'm not familiar with this team. They've been there the whole time. No, they the haven't. Hawaii Fridays. No, yes, the Hawaii Fridays have been in the game the entire time. The Fridays have been in the game the whole time. Yep, the Hawaii Fridays. <laughs> what are you talking about? They have been in the they have been in the game the whole time. The Hawaii Fridays. There is only there is a one new team chat. here. There's one new team, <laughs> and it's a, not can the I Hawaii get Fridays. Corroboration from the chat. Chat, are you familiar with the Hawaii Fridays? They had York Silk. They're famous for York Silk. <laughs> York Silk. York Silk, one Here, of the best I'm, batters in the league. Listen, I'm I'm going down this list, and I'm like, Hades Tigers, who doesn't know them? We all hate them very much. Chicago Firefighters, they were pretty good this year. Then there was the Jazz Hands, the Breckenridge Jazz Hands, that they're like uh, the Moist Talkers uh, league division rival. Uh, there was the Wild Wings. There's the Tokyo Lift, which was it used to be the Crabs, became the Tokyo Lift. Sunbeams. No, what? No? The Tok- the Crabs the, ascended. The Crabs Tokyo asc- Lift are a new team I'm with sorry. new players. I'm sorry. The Crabs ascended and Tokyo Lift is a new team. I apologize. There's the the Sunbeams, the Tacos, the Spies. Spies? Yep, Houston Spies. Spies have been there the whole time though. They've all been here the whole time except for the Tokyo Lift and the the Dale and the Flowers. Yeah. And Miami, the garages, Dallas, Boston flowers, the Seattle garages, the yeah. stakes, the lovers, yeah, the millennials. The, mm-hmm. uh, I'm gonna go ahead and make an executive decision here. Uh, most hated team in the league. I know you were thinking the New York millennials. Is, isn't really? that the most liked team? Nope. Uh, and there's the pies. Uh, of course, my beloved Canada Moist Talkers. There's the Shoe Thieves. There's the Breathmints. There's the Yellowstone Magic. And these are all teams I'm familiar with. And the Hawaii Fridays are just made up. No, that's not true. Um, okay. They've been here the whole time. Uh, I'm looking uh, at their list of players and I'm seeing Sutton Dreamy. And that just doesn't sound like a real person. So, um, Well, a lot of the, a lot of the team is different than it was. I mean, you can see that they no longer even have uh, York Silk. What? Who I believe they have is... someone called Evelton McBlace. Someone bears yeah. the name of the sport. Yeah. Wow. I mean, you can... That's one of their Patreon goals is you can suggest a name. And I think that might be one of those. Sure. I mean, most of them are. But yeah, Stevenson Heat, James Mora, those are all... Those are Those are classic... Friday's pitchers. They're a bad team. I mean, they're not a good team. This is their best season, I think. Let's see. Uh, 
they had they they were they're famous for being one of the lowest winning teams, even though they have one of the best batters, York Silk, who has a special bat that I can't remember the name of. Anyway, I, let me I, talk about I anything asked, about baseball right. except for listing the team names. Um, what was I talking about before you interrupted me with this insane? Oh my god. <laughs> Do you want oh, me to sorry, just, just leave oh, and you can finish you the not, podcast alone? Do you not alone? like in our sh- Do you not like in our show being called out for being interrupty? I thought that we thought that that was good to do. Mm. Uh, Ice Cream Jones in the chat uh, corroborating that Fridays are an original season team. Uh, like seven other people commented after that. None of them weighed in on the Fridays thing. And I just feel like our chat could be a little bit more interactive. You know? You want more of them to agree that the Fridays are an original team? Yeah. Or, you okay. know, or disagree as well, the case in, may be. Chime in in the chat with your opinion yeah. on whether the Fridays are a real team or a new team. No, don't. Chime in with your opinion. I want you to tell me for real if the Fridays were always there. Oh, uh, Seti saying that um, uh, uh, they also confirmed. Oh, I see, yep, I see that. Yeah, there yep. you go. Um, okay, so Blaseball. We talked mm-hmm. about that. Okay, so the other thing, Blaseball, remarkable. You watch Blaseball immediately. So I pick on based on nothing. The Kansas City Breathments as my team, right? Mm-hmm. Back when it was season two, very beginning of season two, day one of season two, I was on board. Um, an old, I'm a, a baseball old head, Kansas City Breath. I have a hat. I have a Breathments hat. Um, yep. That's how. That's how fucking committed I that's am. That's how committed he is. I don't. It's my own. It's my. I only own two baseball caps. I own a Kansas City Breathments baseball cap, and I own a Breathments. Or I mean, uh, and I own a. Um, uh, a cap for my friend's bar who uh, who's who closed their original location for the pandemic and it's not reopened and the, it doesn't even say the name of the place. It says "Don't remember me" <laughs> on the hat. <laughs> that's that <laughs> doesn't count. <laughs> it doesn't count as a baseball hat. No. A, base, a, a baseball cap. It yeah, counts. As a, it cap. counts as a baseball cap. But yeah, I, I said think... I only have two baseball caps. Oh, I do. okay. So I just I one feel of them like... is for baseball. And yeah. one of them is my stupid friend's stupid hat that says "Don't remember me" on it. Um, yeah. And so, okay, so Blazeball. Lexi says, "I don't. I have no idea what Blazeball is." So let me lift the rock that Lexi's been living under off and say, "Blazeball is a simulated random number generator, a, 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 a baseball game, in which every hour there is a new game." Or there's a new set of games. Um, all of the teams play at the same time. All 20 teams play all at once. Um, 10 games what? every separate, hour. Separate. They pair off into right, groups of two off. and play games. against each other. That was implicit in saying there were 10 games. The math well, on that works out to no, two I, games per. Okay. Um, I, I, just haven't I think it's good to be specific. Fun. You're right. There, it's not one big 20, 20 team game, which would be fun, I think. Um, well, I just mean because so much of baseball is so wild that if you don't know it and you're trying to listen along and keep up, you're like, it could well, be totally fair. Like, maybe they do do 20 team games every, I don't it's, know. It's true that there's a lot of wild shit about baseball, but the the other half is that the simulated game is pretty much just ba- baseball it's, it's by just the baseball. rules. Um, it is like, you know, with some exceptions, you know, uh, four balls, three strikes, three outs, nine innings, you know? And it, and it, Um, and it plays out in real time. Uh, it plays out in real time as a, as a, as a text readout. Like if you imagine, like if you wanted to follow a baseball game, but you didn't have a radio or a TV, (laughs) so you had to like watch someone text ticker, like a wall street. Yeah. Like someone just like (laughs) saying like, ah, this person on base, uh, this person's up to bat next. And then they just got a strike. Right. And so it's so minimal what they give you. And it's astounding how quickly you go. This is my team. Ride or die. This is sports. I'm watching this. Like within one, I swear to God, one game I was watching, 
and the the thing that it was giving me was a text readout of the facts of a baseball game, and I was like, "This is sports. This is yeah. what sports feels like." No, I, um, I, uh, my my mom was being driven crazy by this because I got into baseball as well. And and I was like I was telling her about it, her as a longtime sports fan who I have I've been bothering for my entire life because I've never cared about sports almost even a little bit, and now she's getting annoyed because I'm suddenly like here's I'm like trying to get her into fake baseball, <laughs> and she's getting like really mad. I'm like. I, I'm texting you, being like, "Are you watching the game right now? Can you believe that that you know whatever the Breathmints just did such and such?" And then I'm like, yeah. trying to do the same thing with my mom and get her in, in, excited about this silly game. And I think she's just getting frustrated. Uh, did you did you ever have her have her pick a team and then watch the game? No, uh, I, I think that's the end point. Yeah, you've got to give them the buy-in right. of, the, of just picking an arbitrary that's, team because right. that's all your sports team is uh-huh. anyway. Yep, it's picked for you based on where you were born. Yeah. Oh, and and here this is the thing. Uh, and I said uh, I tweeted about this. I was like, oh, my poor mom. You know that I've been totally disinterested in her sports fandom for my whole life, and now I'm being really annoying about fake baseball. And uh, and she responded like ah keyword fake, and I responded with like see like now if you were actually paying attention to baseball you would realize that it's just it's it, it, like it it is the realest sport or baseball just reveals uh, how fake all sports are. <laughs> right. Well, it's, it's just a game. The it, only difference is that one of them has real players. Yeah. Actually performing. Um. One of them has real players, and the other one takes place in real life. <laughs> um, so, so this is, I think, the point of interest for me for this game is like watching what the RNG spits out, uh, participating in the meta game of buying votes and trying to, like, like figure out what would be best for my team, balancing out. Well, we're one of the smaller teams, so we don't have a lot of votes. Um, but we still want to vote for something good. Like I'd rather, I'd rather get one, (sighs) I'd rather get one thing than nothing, but like, I want to get the best thing that we possibly can, but the crabs have a billion fucking votes. And so we can never get the best stuff, you know? Oh, that's right. Um, Unlike a real sport, you actually have the ability to make your team better or at least collectively all the fans of a team can by voting in elections to give yeah. yourself things like a fourth strike. Fourth strike. Um, That's monstrous. Yeah. Anytime uh, a team we had a gets strike a one fourth season. strike, it's fucked up. Um, and then there's decrees, um, popular vote decrees that like change like like major league things r- sometimes. League rules. Uh, inter league rules, new weather, um, um, new story stuff. There's like a very weird story, um, uh, and it all you know. I, I I won't waste any time trying to explain what the plot of Blazeball is, the overarching plot. But uh, you know, if you're interested, there's there's like videos out there that people have made uh, of like all the story stuff that's happened. But there's other things too. Well, there's people who want to come up with. There's people who want to do like lore shit and come up with lore and honestly it or, bugs me but oh no it's great it's great that people are want to do fake stories about people take it too serious people hmm. people want to do people want to have the pro- here's their the problem lore with lore canonized by I, the fandom uh, that's the problem uh, it's an, that's what bugs me but like it's great that you have this other whole other section of people interested in blaze ball because they have funny names and they can decide that someone is is a you know, a goo monster or is a tree or whatever. I've been in the, I've been uh, in and out of the, um, baseball discord. I just pretty much just spend any time I spend there in like the Breathman specific chat room. And I'm very lucky that I picked a team that has, uh, no, has basically a, like a default, no cannon policy. <laughs> they don't, <laughs> Because this has caused literal problems because fandoms are bad Mm -hmm. where there's like long, arduous discussions I've heard, you know, secondhand uh, about what is the real story of a character. 
and it's like that's so these obnoxious. are stupid numbers <laughs> it doesn't mean anything can't we just all bullshit and you know if you want to make a joke make a joke and it doesn't have to be a uh, mm. written in a lore bible anywhere uh, and I have accidentally picked a team that agrees with that. <laughs> um, so that's been nice. Yeah, I, there, um, there are a lot of there are people out there doing like tons of fan art like, you know, but uh, it's great. Yeah, do your fan. art. Oh, There's no, been it's some great. Really good fan art. Yeah, it's great. I mean, fan art is just not something I'm into in general. So like, I, I think it's great that everybody wants to like draw these characters and imagine, uh, you know, what they look like and stuff. But I, I would say that's not some that's not something i'm personally interested in baseball like i don't want i don't want someone else's vision of what these characters look like uh i just want to imagine them in my head um uh i will i'll disagree just based on that um uh if there's fan art for anything that is fun for me to look at it's pretty much only baseball (laughs) this is the first time that i you know we have our our long time a best pitcher, or at least best, highest stars pitcher, Winnie Hess. That, despite what I said about our our resistance to um, taking anything too seriously, is has been serious, serially um, uh, uh, drawn as a horse. Sometimes as a literal horse, sometimes <laughs> as an anthropomorphized horse. Great, and she's just our pitcher, and she's just a horse. She's just a horse. That's great. Um, See, I and had that's great, and on, it's fun stuff like that. It's fun on my team. There was a character named Eugenia Garbage, and yeah. I thought that was a great name. I just loved great that we name. we had a we had a batter who was like fine, uh, but her name was Garbage, uh, and now like I don't know how much fan art there is, but my understanding is that like the the fanon behind Eugenia Garbage has become that like. She is a garbage humun- homunculus. Like she is a living yeah. person of garbage. There's a lot of that, and yeah, yeah, yeah. You, like they take it's it's a lot of the of like taking the names really literally, and that's great that people are having fun with that. But in my mind, I'm like, you've ruined Eugenia Garbage for me. Like she's not a garbage person. That's just her name. Come right. on, I totally agree. I think that that's always the weakest shit is when you take the names too literally. Can't like they should. We have the because what was the your horse? Have a sort of what was your horse picture? Wh- Winnie Hess. Oh my god. Okay, so Winnie. That's it's fun. a Winnie pun. That's yeah, fun. That's, I think that's that's a. Fun. But we also have, um, I think, sort of an like an anti lore character, which is one one of my favorite jokes. Uh, Oscar Vaughn is a dentist, a regular guy who's a dentist. Okay, and that's pretty much the cat. The catchphrase <laughs> of this guy is that he's just like, I'm just a regular guy. <laughs> <laughs> And I always thought that that was a fun sort of like mm-hmm. like uh, not anti like against but like anti like uh, opposite of like it's yeah. sort of like the opposite of a backstory is you have a character who's just some guy. Um, uh, anyway, uh, but like, I think, that, I think the, the fan the fan art is another whole avenue of people uh, like of of like uh, like a direction of interest into yeah uh, Blaze Ball. There's that. There's the lore stuff. There's uh, me who just likes the RNG thing. There's the people who are really invested in the plot. There's you know it's just a it's just a like uh, a, a bizarre thing that on paper is extremely simple that has um, a lot of really fun ways to get into it, and it's just a blast to like watch these stupid games that are just literally text readouts of the facts of a baseball game no color zero color the color is all imagination no there's yellow oh there's yellow it's Sorry. Bla- there's black and white and yellow yeah um so that's place ball that's my number that's my number three that's game. great and it was it was funny because in in some ways like place ball happened I, I guess it it came out of the fact that all the sports leagues were on hiatus over the summer. That's at least that's at least part of what caught fire about it. And and so what's inter- what's interesting is that it was like people's um, replacement for sports in some ways. And then like I, I've said before, it's like once you get really into it, you realize how like how immaterial to the experience of being a fan of a sports team and following it. How immaterial it being a physically real team that actually exists like is to sports fandom 
and I lost where I was going. Oh, I think, I think, I think like along with video conferencing being a thing that everyone does every day is going to be one of the things is like this like virtual sports thing, like not esports, but like virtual sports. I think it's just going to stick around. Well, now. I, I, I don't know how successful anything else could be i think they really nailed it with baseball being the sport that this is modeled after yeah baseball, baseball really is such that. a unique and individual thing yeah it is like it's it's asymmetrical and it's really one it's a pair it's of one, people doing action at a time right you know? like a baseball has baseball has singular events happening within its game in a way that like soccer and football and hockey totally don't and basketball right. which is why baseball is like the radio sport right yeah and football is the tv yeah sport. And, and that's that's the thing it was like a lot of time following a, a baseball game uh it reminded me like oh this is like i finally understood like listening to a baseball game on the radio it was like a thing i never got before and i was like oh i get this now now i get how baseball became america's pastime because it works for radio really well yeah um so yeah, yeah I don't I, think I don't think there's suddenly going to be a baseball for every sport, but I feel like this concept isn't going to go away. I think I, I think bet, you do it for golf. <laughs> well, here's the thing, maybe they do it for soccer or or football, but they just someone goes further and makes it like a maybe they add a little bit more visual elements. Maybe they make an actual 3D simulation of a soccer match you can watch or something. I don't I don't know what the thing you is, but I feel do that like in like FIFA yeah, I get and people like, uh, and people John do. Boyce had that thing for um uh whatever fucking sports site. I think S P S L S what is the I don't know. Anyway, whatever. Well, it was I, like uh it was like an entire it was like let's ruin basketball where they seeded the NBA in in this two K game with the worst possible player that you could make. And and made it so that any time a new player was needed, it drafted a copy of the worst possible player and just watched as the end as the end as the players as the teams with the most actual NBA players became more and more and more dominant and slowly just died off. <laughs> but the, the it was great. It's a great thing. It's like forty minutes long. I totally recommend it. Um, uh, and the ending is a little bit, um, uh, uh, I don't know, not of a let, not a letdown. It's a little bit deflated, but um, but the core there is that you can just get like a two K game to do virtual basketball for you. Um, yeah, no, you you can do that with all these things. I think I think maybe the the thing that baseball really hit upon was something, you know, something that's constantly happening throughout the week that you can check in on quickly on your phone whenever like i think if some yeah. someone can figure out something along those lines i think that's the thing because yeah you're yeah. right there are like people that do like seasons of fifa simulations that they like cast or whatever and people can watch them but it's not it's not really the it's same thing the same. like yeah like a, a no. game of baseball is like five, what 10 minutes or something like yeah like between 15 and 25 minutes there are there are special rules for if it lasts two hours mm -hmm. and it's never lasted over an hour mm -hmm. i believe or i believe it is it has never lasted over an hour in a way that matters oh um, vacuum lexi says space ball the only sport played in the vacuum of space and that just made me think the movie space balls and then the big vacuum the, the and i'm like vacuum. oh the vacuum of space and got then they it go, suck 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 wow well i yeah. i knew all, all the suck and blow jokes i i got as a kid i was very cultured back then so i was uh, i did have the intelligence to to understand those uh, hilarious jokes um, oh, the thing you didn't understand was that vacuum is a pun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the vacuum of space. Which I mean, I don't even um, know. I don't even know that that's what they were doing in Spaceballs. Like, I don't know that Mel Brooks was making that pun, but it right. it does exist. It does exist because I proved it. Paradise Killer. What the fuck is that? Oh shit, this was the thing that sounded really cool and you were like, you should play it. And I was like, I should. And then I totally forgot that it existed. 
and it's my number two game of the year. It totally deserves it. I ate this game up. I basically played it nonstop from Man. start to finish with sleep in the middle. Hey, remember all those times when I checked in on you and was like, hey, how's your list coming? And you were just like, ah, I don't have a list. Bye. I could have. No. Maybe, maybe you should have been like, yeah, on my list is things like Paradise Killer and Crusader Kings 3 and Microsoft Flight Sim. You, and we I would have been tell like, each other oh, our yeah, lists. those games. That's right. But well, we no, but we do sometimes say, "Hey, you should play Remember this to game." Play this. Yeah, we, yeah, so we well, do. We do is say that. That when I played this in October or something or November, I did tell you to play it, and it was very recently. Oh yeah. Um. So Paradise Killer, wow, what a game! This is this game. And I'll, maybe I'll get to this in a minute, but this game gives you a little bit of that crusader kings three thing of having you think in the way of someone who sucks um in a way that's that i'm, is, I'm really good at that i'm doing that like almost all the time <laughs> um so paradise killer and i and i won't do spoilers because i i genuinely think that my top two games this year people should really go and play uh for themselves um, I mean, I think people should play all of these yeah, games wow. on my list. So, but like, bold but year. the other the other two games, I was not the other three games. Sorry, the other three games, I wasn't. I'm not worried about spoiling anything in Crusader Kings Three or Microsoft Flight Simulator. So that's the that's the difference. Um, so Paradise Killer, you are the exiled former investigator of like like basically you're the cop of this like island of essentially demigods or like um members of this members of a religious order it's sort of not exactly clear how you might describe these people but they have built what they call a paradise world they've built a paradise world in service to a slew of dying gods who they aim to restore. Um, and anytime the paradise fails, they start over. Anytime something bad happens, anytime it, the reality starts to break down, they ditch it, build a new one, try to improve on it. And you're about to do it again. You're about to go to a whole new paradise. Mm -hmm. And the propaganda is, um, that this next one is the one that's going to be perfect. And then we can really get on to this saving the gods thing um, that we've been putting off. Mm -hmm. And the, the day, the la the day of the last day, the, basically the entire council of this, of this, um, this paradise world is murdered. Hmm. Um, and they bring you out of exile um, this is a world of gods and demons and aliens and extremely bloody violent war, which is the, which the paradise is supposed to be an escape from. The reason you're exiled is because you allowed, you know, centuries and centuries ago, you allowed a demon to trick you into mm, giving up the uh, master emerald. To giving up the master emerald me what about you um and so you you, you get exiled like you weren't and so it's and so it's controversial that you're being brought back but um you're back and your job is to investigate this crime um there we go this is this is a good description thank you ice cream jones who calls the the characters of this game immortal cultists exiled from earth the gods of this game as you discover are horrific uh warmongering bloodthirsty like absolute monster gods um the people of this game, the people, the immortal cultists who are the protagonists and antagonists of this game, uh, are living essentially the sickest and most disturbing possible reality. Uh, and the thing of this game is both being genuinely interested in the crime and in solving the murder, 
And in learning more about what this place is, why it is, what the society is like, and to a lesser extent, why the why anyone would want any of this to be their paradise. Um, and mm. it is kind of it kind of is more of a visual novel than anything. Um, mm. It is a it is a first person first person game. You're you're going from place to place, talking to people, but you really are talking to people, mm. and that's kind of what the game is. There's not a lot of choice except on the choice of where to go, how much to look into things, which questions you think are important to ask, and how long you're willing to play until you decide, okay, this is over. It's time for the trial. Um. Oh, so it's Danganronpa. I have not played it. Don't. Um. But so, but, uh, but Danganronpa is a game where it's like a bunch of high school kids locked in a place, and when someone gets killed, then it's it's like a detective adventure game where you go around and collect clues and talk to people, and then you decide when to start the trial, which then becomes kind of phoenix right ish sort of but it's like it's like that like you start a trial and then you try to find who the killer is but you do that like 10 times in the game and in paradise killer what only once just once okay uh jesse says i expected it to be danganronpa ish based on the style with mm. 2d characters and all but it's a lot more open and not like that okay um so i guess it's maybe kind of like that but also pretty much not uh, but the the character design, the characters themselves, the personalities, extremely fascinating. The, the, I mean, it's really like, did you ever watch, um, I think it was called Broad Church? No. Broad Church is a um, David Tennant cop show. Yeah where he plays a disgraced detective that gets basically sent out to the country uh, to to what should have been a nothing job, and then there's immediately a murder. Right. Now, am I right and, that Broad Church is the American version that stars David Tennant is, is a remake of a British show that also starred David Tennant? I didn't even know there was an American version. Oh, okay. Wait, you didn't know there was an American version? Um, no, I'm. Oh. I'm I've. I, is there an American version? I don't know if that's even I, true. Maybe I'm just super wrong about all of this. I think maybe you're just wrong. I, I mean, it's pause. I watched. I thought two seasons. I and thought. I, think uh, that there's, I thought David Tennant had an American accent in this show because it takes place in America. No, he absolutely does not have an American accent in the show. He has his normal life Scottish accent. Oh, I believe. All That's right. my memory of it anyway. Maybe I just got Any- some bad info like really early when that show came out or something. I don't know. I don't know what happened so there. It my bad. It came out in 2013. Yeah. So it was a long time ago. But um, so I watched the first two seasons of the show. Uh, and I especially really liked the first season. The second season had some interesting ideas too. Uh, but the idea is basically like what is... Um, the investigation of this sort of crime. Uh, there is a U.S. version. It got canceled. It did star David Tennant with an American accent. It got canceled. Okay. So, um, it's the. I mean, and I can tell oh. you, I can tell you in this next sentence why it got canceled. It's because it's about how horrific it is to investigate a, mur- a murder. Oh, it was renamed uh, for Grace the people Point. Of the town. I guess there's Grace a show Point. called Grace Point that also stars David Tennant solving a different murder. Okay. So the 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 idea of the show is that that when a police officer has to solve a murder, it dis- it it. It, it is such a disruptive event to a town. Hmm. Uh, it is just as, if not more disruptive than the murder itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it can essentially tear the town apart because you you essentially um, criminalize in your mind the entire, everyone who you talk to. Right. You have to catch everyone in every lie 
that they tell for any reason because it all could make them the murderer. Mm-hmm. Um, and Paradise Killer is not exactly about that, but it is a show where, or I mean, it is a game where you are rooting through people's lives, discovering when and why they're lying and what different relationships cause them to say or do different things. Uh, and it's sort of fascinating to sort of tear through the lives of these people as essentially a cop. Um, the You are called the investigation freak is what they derogatorily call you. Um, Sorry, what do they, they say don't like call you? Because you were exiled. What's that? What, what do they call you? The investigation freak. Oh, okay. Because um, they don't like you because you were exiled. Gotcha. Um, because you sold out to a demon, um, which is what they do. They try to get you to sell out to them. Uh, they try to trick you into thinking that it's the right thing to do. Is demons what, what in do. general, you mean? Demons, yeah. Well, demons specifically in Paradise Killer. Sure. Um, and uh, and so you're you go. It is. It's just like. It's sort of like, like, imagine an island with the worst criminals that, like, the world's governments have to offer. Mm -hmm. And you are one of them, and also you're the cop there. Mm. So just like a regular cop then. Well, but what if you were, no, it's what if you were like Henry Kissinger. Wow. Like, that's the cop. (laughs) What? Not a regular cop. (laughs) That's so much worse. Yeah, that's see, that's what I mean. Like, what if you were a cop, but also Jeff Bezos and on an island of full of Henry Kissinger's and Bill Gates's? You know, well, like that is it? the well, real world. I mean, I feel that's like the real world equivalent. Henry Kissinger is like worse than Jeff Bezos, though, right? I think that they're very. They're both awful for different. It's not worth. It's not it's, it's not, not worth it's not worth tearing scaling apart. It. Okay. Yeah. Um they're both so bad it doesn't matter, you know? Uh uh like do you want a gunshot to the front of your brain or the side of your brain? Oh, it did the thing where it puts the one, it indents the one at the end of the list. Five, four, three, two, blank one. Blank one. So um so so you get but you but you also you're spending time like these characters are likable characters. You know? Mm-hmm. You meet them and you talk to them and you have favorite. You have ones that you like and ones that you hate. You have people that your character gets along with. She was exiled, so you get <coughs> Excuse me. You have this immediate sympathy with this character. Especially because you have a fully zero understanding of the society yet, right? And so as you sweep away at the dirt and you go, you you understand that participation in this place is, is a condemnation in itself. Mm. And you investigate this crime, which is... Um, you know, an in, an, uh, an interesting... The journey that you take to uncover what the reality of this crime is an interesting one. And so you come away with this sort of dual reality of, you know, the the punishment for the crime is is death, right? They say whoever you find guilty, the 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 you know, the justice um the embodiment of justice says you investigate the crime and you decide who gets punished and we will listen to you. Um and um, so you come away with this dual sense where you're like, pretty much all of these people deserve to die. Mm-hmm. But also, none of these people deserve to die for this. At the same, literally at the same exact time, you're living these two mm. realities in your head where you're like, based on. Based on the plot of the story, I'm feeling one way, and based on the based on the lore of the world, I'm feeling another way. Hmm. Um, and it's fascinating. 
Uh, and and I and I don't I won't not I'm not gonna spoil anything, but um, I I beat it twice. I didn't play through it twice. I reloaded the save and redid the last bit to get it to to do a different thing to see what would happen. And uh, the first time I named um, some people as complicit, and they were killed, and. I felt bad about it uh, because these, these character designs are a lot. They're a lot, yeah. I I so I felt bad about it because I was like, of all of the people here, maybe maybe a couple of them deserved this less, even if they were involved. Even if I think that they were involved anyway. Um, and so I and, and then at the end. They basically gave me a little, we know you, like post credits, they gave me a little like, we know you killed these people, don't you feel bad about it, little thing. And at the same time, so I went back and and was like, what if I, what if I do this without killing them? Can I get through it? Can I get through the sort of the, um, the maze of the, of the trial without killing these characters? And I could... But I was like, but these people fucking suck. <laughs> they're like, they're they're monsters. Like, mm-hmm. like, like. They, but the game does this sympathy and thing. It, it plays with this sympathy in a really interesting way. Mm-hmm. Uh, where I think that, like, by asking, by asking you to tie their their guilt or innocence to a crime have really spun how you can see them as people versus if you were just told, you know, uh, told the story of this place in like, for, in like a book where they, they just explain to you all the lore mm-hmm. and they say, you can push the button and just blow up the paradise. And you're like, yeah, fuck yeah. Push the button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, fascinating, fascinating game, really fun, great characters. Um, and uh, you, you, so you play as, uh, you play as this heart woman. I, I, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, lady love dies. Late lady love dies. Love dies. That's the her name. name. Yeah. Um, ice cream Jones, another good explanation here. Uh, you're you're interrogating Henry Kissinger like who killed Epstein? Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> um, and and so these are I, I have them up on screen here. These characters. Um, wow, Sean's in this game. That's amazing. Uh, it sh- it sure is a look, and and here and you're this. You're this lady. Yep. I wow. Look from looking at this art, I sh- sure wouldn't guess that the that this is a horrible person. This looks like a person the game really wants you to like because yeah. she's covered in hearts. Yeah. But then yeah. you're like, wow, you're not great. No. Wow. Um, and the game the game is just visually absolutely stunning. I mean, it is like. If you if you were if you were really uncharitable and you really didn't like the story or it wasn't grabbing you or you're just sort of a persnickety player and I'm characterizing someone who doesn't like this game as a as an asshole because uh, I can't it, I just can't imagine it, not liking wait, is it. Is this a 3D game? What is happening here? It's a 3D game with 2D sprites as char- as the characters. Oh, so you you talk to these 2D sprites and then they their like character art pops up on the side. Okay, like, you've got yeah like that. Um. But as they stand in the world, they are 2D sprites. Right. I'm seeing this. the game this. is 3D. Um, okay. And uh, I, would say, I would say partially voice acted, not fully voice acted. Um, mm. And, uh, and but, but so moving around the world, especially after you get some power-ups, um, is pretty fun. The traversal, like it's a lot, it's kind of a collecty. Like they fill, they basically they fill the world with collectibles that you then use to buy different um, 
upgrades, kind of not like a lot, but like a little. Um, you all, it's also your currency for fast for fast traveling. Um, so there is fast travel in the game, um, and uh, but it's so much fun to just run around and and Shinji's out there. You got to say you got to see all the Shinji dialogue. I was a very much a completionist here. Um, Shinji's a demon who's sort of pesters you throughout the game hmm. uh, as like a weak harmless demon who just kind of wants to see the show mm-hmm. um and is a, a, acts a little bit as your guide that was the weird cross-legged fox thing with the brick so head. that's so it's ryuk so this is like Rampa, but it's death note but it's uh evil gods um and and yeah, so I think like the weakest and easiest to criticize part of the game is that there's a lot of running back and forth because they ask you to use mm. your currency to do the fast traveling. But Ugh. going through the world, it's so I mean, and also they gi- they give you a, a mm. collectible detector. So it's not a big deal to find the collectibles, um, which have a currency. Um, uh, the world is just so stunning and the movement is is fun enough where. I didn't use. I didn't start fast traveling until about eighty percent of the way through the game. Hmm. Um, uh, anyway, that's the that's the that's the game. The weakest part is the traveling, except for I liked it and I didn't have a problem with it. <laughs> uh, uh, I Great. like the the. I swear to the the plot of this thing had me thinking I was about to wrap it up three times when something big happened. Like hmm. it's good. Like it's well written. Uh, it's well voiced. The the interpersonal and intrapersonal character shit is all extremely good, uh, and the lore is, um, I think, like some of the strongest like world building stuff because it it acts like I said, sort of like it's running in the exact opposite direction as the investigation plotline. Um, and it just ruled. I just thought it was great. Cool. You ready for my number one game of the year? I sure am. Kentucky Route Zero. Whoa. How did... How did I know? How was sort my of, guess? Kind of process of elimination, yeah, right? Yeah, pretty much. When uh, when Blaze Ball was three. Yeah, when Blaze Ball was three, I was like... Wow, if this, if this isn't Kentucky Route this? Zero, I don't even know. Uh, no. I don't know. I genuinely don't know if we need to. Uh, no, honestly, Kentucky Route Zero is like number nine on my list, so why don't we just talk about it now? Okay. Number nine, huh? Did you finish it? I finished it yesterday. Okay, so you started it a week ago or something like that? Yeah, yeah, I played it in a week. Okay, so, so I, have I an it, interesting, was, it was full on game of the year crunch mode. I have an interesting, um, uh, I guess it's not that interesting. I have I have a slightly interesting history with this game because the it was it's an episodic game which neither of us like. Um, and well, you know, it's, and the other well, the thing about Kentucky Route Zero is that the first episode came out seven years ago, and episode five just came out this year, uh, right. along so along the with a console episode, version that has all of them in there. When the first episode came out, I played about half an hour of it, maybe less, and I was like, "This is interesting. It's a little weird. Wow. It's a little spooky. Mm-hmm. Let me wait until it's all out." <laughs> okay and, and then ages passed and uh yeah, kingdoms yeah. rose and fall and, <laughs> fell yeah and the, uh, yeah i was no longer a te- then i stopped being a teenager and right. i'm now almost 30 <laughs> um uh and and it and it it finally came it finally finished and i was like here we go let's do it let's play this game i restarted act one uh, i mean obviously uh almost it's almost a hundred percent brand new to me oh that's fine um, i had to i played act one at the beginning of the year and i still had to replay act one so it's fine yeah so i replay i replayed act one at the beginning of the year i i played through act one through act four halfway through act four interesting um and uh and all of the interstitials mm-hmm 
You play. I assume you played all the interstitials. Yeah, there are interstitial acts that there are interstitial chapters that come in between the five acts. Uh, that I guess back in the day were like posted on. They were like posted on the website and weren't traditionally available. And it was like kind of come like there was a good chance well, you might not free. know. Yeah, it was free on the website. Well, it's just that you might not know that they existed. <laughs> Apparently, yeah, was the fair, yeah. thing. And and that's all fixed now because they've update. You know, all the all the versions of the game like have this nice interface that combines all the acts and all the interstitials and stuff. Because like yeah. those interstitials are really important, especially that last one. <laughs> Oh yeah, that last one is extremely important. Yeah, like it, I mean, I consider all of them to be inseparable from the game. Now, um, pitch me on your stance. Pitch me on that stance for the first interstitial, please. Limits and demonstrations. Yes, and and and, and so I just re- I also re-listened to the podcast uh, of Waypoint talking about Kentucky Route Zero Ooh, and Act that Five came been a out. Good idea. Um, and they didn't get to, they didn't get to talk spoilers because act five wasn't out, even though they had played it. Um, but what was interesting was like, uh, when Austin asked, I think Patrick, like what he had played, I think Patrick was like, oh, I've played up through act three. Maybe it wasn't Patrick, whatever. Uh, and, and then Austin goes, did you play limits and demonstrations? And then the person said yes. And he went, okay. And now, and I heard that and I'm like. Now, what could that angle have possibly been? Because I look pa- I look back on Kentucky Route Zero, and I say, wow, pretty much everything in that game is, like, important and relevant to the story and the themes and everything, except I'm really not sure what Limits and Demonstrations was even about. I mean, the main character of Limits and Demonstrations was Lula Chamberlain, who did all the art. Right. And, I mean, the character Lula did the art that was the showcase of limits of demonstrations. Yeah. And she was a character that made several appearances. Mm-hmm. I mean, they they talked about her at least several times. No, she was there. Uh, she was like all through act two. She was, there. she was in the building, right? Yeah. Yeah. She was okay. in the, I the Bureau anyway, I, of Reclaimed I played it, I played Spaces. This act, act one, I played it in January or gotcha. something. Um, and, uh, but that's all you have for me. It's just like, that that character did that art installation. That's why it's important. Well, if I rem- if I remembered it, it mm. definitely was relevant at the time in January. Uh, tell okay. me what tell me what you do in limits and demonstrations, and I'll I'll try to in, remember why I thought it was in limits and demonstrations. Limits and what did I say? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I was just speaking me. in limits and demonstrations. Uh, three characters who who are new to you at the time. Uh, have just walked into Lula, uh, some kind of Lula Chamberlain retrospective exhibit where it's like five different art installations that she did over a period of time in one room so you can walk around and look at them and they are graphical things that float in the, they're, they're art, they're art. It's like you walked into it. Hey, imagine you walked into an an art museum room full of art installations and then looked at them. That's the thing. And then it's over. Right? Well, okay. No, so okay. First sorry. Of all, I, I mean, that, I don't, I don't mean to I sound... I remembered all that. I don't mean to sound so combative and aggressive. Because... Too late and <laughs> also, that's also you. Okay. I'm sorry. Wow, that stone that you hit me with just hurt. Wow, how'd you get it all the way from your glass house that you were inside of? I'm not the one being combative and aggressive all day. It's just you in general. You're doing it right now. It's defensive and aggressive, not combative. Sorry. Anyways, my point is, I'm not like... I. Sorry, I was just interested to know because you were like, oh, that thing that limits and demonstrations is really important. And I was like, oh, I've heard that, but that's not my feeling about that thing. So how what's your stance on that? And it just sounded like your stance was you don't really remember, but it was important. I mean, so your your refresher didn't help. And the reason was because I remembered that it was at the art show because we talked oh, about it already. Yeah. The thing that I don't remember specifically is what each piece was. What I remember is that each piece is both thematically uh, 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 thematically relevant to 
Kentucky Route Zero mm. as a as a whole, it touches on a lot of the things that Kentucky Route Zero is about broadly, and it also features the art of a character who's in the game already, and features uh, three characters who will be in the game later. Right, and so actually, that's, oh, that's right, I, they were in the game already, sort of. So sort of. they're not even right. new in that chapter, actually. No, no, but they become physical and real <laughs> in later chapters. I don't know what you're talking about. In a they, later chapter. They were always physical um, and real. I don't know what you mean. Uh, so physical. They become not... Uh, they become physical ghosts instead of They were of always physical. You couldn't get ghosts. past their table. Uh, uh, Conway was all like, hey, could you scoot in your chairs? And they wouldn't listen. But they weren't there. <laughs> well, I, oh, okay. Sorry, Keith. Were, uh, Keith has embodied the consciousness of the zero, and now he can say with certainty who is there and who isn't. Okay. Well, you look away, and then where are they? Uh, I don't know, because I walked away and I got the twenty-sided die, and I came back, and they were gone. So I don't know where they went. But, uh, but then I could get through because they were gone. Anyway. The, I mean, the whole thing's about ghosts. It's the damn ghost show. It's a damn. Um, it's a damn ghost show. It's a damn ghost. Even when they're the whole, the whole thing, the whole thing of the fifth, um, the the last interlude and in the fifth act is that they don't even have to be dead for them to have been ghosts. Um, mm. but anyway, that's I. If I the thing about limits of demonstrations is if I had a better memory of what the, the demonstrations were, oh, okay, then I would have a better idea of exactly how it connected to the game. But because I don't remember the specifics of okay. them, I'd, I cannot I'd, be specific. All I meant was, is there something really obvious that I was missing? No. And I guess, no. yeah, I guess the answer is no. Right. Um, except, but it's also the game is it's. This is a game that is, and I don't mean to sound pretentious about it. It's just, I'm just being literal. It's art in almost a way that I I don't have the words to describe. And so to have a, 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 a one of the interstitials being a sort of theme heavy presentation of, of, uh, feelings and of um, like uh, like emotions and character perspective is not even so much different from what the game is as a whole as to be notable for not having mm. stuff in it because the a lot of the game is notable for not having stuff in it. I yeah. Think. So uh, the vibe of Kentucky Route Zero, it's a, it's like a point and click adventure game. I get it wasn't I would play it on switch so there wasn't any pointing and clicking happening I had direct control over the characters um, but it's a point and click adventure game that has uh, no real puzzles to speak of I, there, there's like a couple spots here and there where you could argue that it's kind of like an impediment to progress that you have to work through but it's not like a puzzle um, and uh, it largely it is um, it's it's a story about it's it's a it, it, magical realism is one of the the things going on a lot in that story. So it's a lot of stuff of um, what am I trying to get at? It's it's a lot of stuff that is meant to make more uh, emotional sense than literal sense. Um, there's a lot of you know it's it's a game about small moments and conversations that make you think and it's it's a very kind of like emotional sort of thing it's you know it's not a game in the sense that you're working through puzzles or levels but it's just sort of like a narrative experience that you read through and there is a lot of reading um more it's, reading. it's like it's practically also, a book except for that the visuals are a big part of it as well so it's the visuals are the visuals are a big part it's it is um it's constructed in a really unique way. Um, one of my favorite tricks, the game is almost entirely background. They change what you're looking at, all the, what, what you're looking at and how you, how you control characters, how you interface with the game all the time. And they use the act breaks and the interstitials to, to do that. Um, 
sort of uh but uh but uh, but one of the main ways is that you are extremely pulled back from if you're controlling anything at all from what from who or what you're controlling um and mm. one of my favorite tricks that they do is by having having something go by silhouetted in the foreground i think it works really well oh, okay. um but the sound is amazing i had to play this game with headphones because um there's just so much going on in the sound uh that mm. i just couldn't get all of it listening to it on the speakers um and um but i think if i had to summarize a sto- what it is for people who haven't played it i would say that <clears throat> it is it's a game about If I can say what the game is about, <laughs> I and could try what the game does. To, I could try two separate things. this one if you want. Um, here I'll I'll go and then you can you can go okay. separate and maybe that'll that'll be enough. Uh, it's a game about not being able. It's a game about being prevented from going where you need to go because of the way that the world is, literally, and also figuratively. And the way that it does, the, the way that it, part of the way that it does that is by telling a story about how money and com- companies have cont- direct and indirect control over people's lives. And then that mm. is sort of played out in a sort of dreamy and ghostly topography of a geographical world that seems impossible to navigate. Mm. In Kentucky Route Zero, uh, you 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 enter the story on the con- the character of Conway uh, and his dog that you can either name Blue or Homer or nothing. Uh, what did you name the dog? Blue. I named it Homer, which I understand is uh, is a minority decision. Most people seem to go with blue. Uh, but a dog just seemed like a Homer to me. Um, I assume Homer Simpson. No. I'm, no? I'm thinking more like Homer the poet. You know, I don't know. I'm not. I'm, Homer Simpson's not a poet. Uh, oh, sorry. No, I, I, there was I, another I famous Homer. Homer. I'm sorry, reference. Keith. Uh and anyway, so okay, so home, uh, not Homer. Conway's thing is he is a delivery driver for an antique store, and uh, we learn early that he is on his final delivery uh, because uh, Lisette, the owner of the antique sh- store, is closing up shop, um, and so this is his last delivery until he is like done. I think sometimes there's like questions that are like, "Are you retiring?" and he's like, "Not sure." Or something like that, or or he's like, or he doesn't know what he's going to do, possibly because he's not able to retire. I don't think they get into this very very much. But anyways, so so Conway is trying to get his last delivery to Five Dogwood Drive is the address that he's going to, and he can't find it, and so he stops for directions at a gas station, and um and then it, it kind of goes from there. It, it becomes like this unfolding story of Conway and the people that he meets, and he kind of you know. Um, it's one of those stories where like characters will start to glom onto the main character, and then it becomes kind of like an ensemble thing. Um, I think in in Act One, Conway meets um, Shannon Marquez, Marque- Mar- Marquez, I Marquez, think. Um, and uh, it, so so he's trying to he's trying to deliver uh, his his an- these antiques to Five Dogwood Drive. And uh, he and and he's directed by a gas station attendant to go meet uh, Weaver Marquez, um, who I then think tells you to get on the zero. Uh, you know, quick early on, Conway learns that he needs to to go on the zero to get where he's going, the the Kentucky Route Zero, um, which turns out to be 
um, let's say a, a like a place of questionable reality or space. It's sort of like a yeah. It's kind of like a twilight zone that's sort of half there and half not there. It's like it's people people in the quote unquote real world talk about it like it's a place that they've been to, but they're like that place is really weird. Stuff doesn't make sense in there, and I try not to go there if I can help it or a whatever. A lot of the places in the game Kentucky Route Zero have a sort of ethereal. Silent Hillness to it, where it's difficult right. to determine what is real and not real. Difficult to determine if the place that you're at is is a physical place, or if it's even, or if it's if it's geographical, or if it's a li- like a even like it's just laid over reality. It's difficult to understand how it works, and I think mm. key thematically is that it's difficult to even to even yeah. know where you're going once and, you're there and this is a this is kind of like a big this is a big vibe that comes out of magical realism like a lot of magical realism stuff is about what's real what's not or what is the line between what's real and what's not or you know the, these things happening that seem unreal that ha- seem to have real consequences for the world or the story that's like a big magical realism thing. It's a, it's, and I haven't read a lot of magical realism. It's, it's part of why I suspect I might have trouble interfacing with that genre because I think, I think this like, this, this muddy place of like of unclear reality is like a space that my brain does not play in very easily. Um, so like it, it's like sometimes, and and I think, hmm. I, I don't. I had something to well, say. This maybe is maybe I'll skip what's it. different. This is maybe what's different between us mm-hmm. as game players. I could talk about this game for a long time before mentioning Conway, let alone mention God, the I gas station at the knew it. Of Act One. God, I knew it. I knew the moment I said Conway that you were going to be like, I wouldn't even bring up Conway as the main character. Well, I think that the I, I I think that the game I think you're right when you called it sort of an ensemble because I, I you know it works really well to not identify a main character, but I do think that Conway's story is one of the most illustrative things. It's one of the most literal yeah. things that the game and, does. And Conway is the character that you have I mean Okay, again, with the point-and-click control versus direct control. But Conway is the character you have direct control over for, let's say, two-thirds of the game? Like, two-thirds of the on-screen time of the game, I would say, is, like, you're controlling Conway. Like, in in movement space, once it gets to dialogue, it's less of a Conway-only thing. But, like, Conway is the lens through which you are viewing the story for most of the story. Yeah, and I think I think that that's that is the thing about the game. The vibe that it gives me is less of a game, uh, less of controlling Conway, and more of like assembling the viewing experience of the game. Yeah, if that makes sense. Sort of like like uh, you just you use movement to just position the characters in the spot where the where like the yeah, pages can turn right mo- moving you know? around moving around the world is is pretty inconsequential like you were talking about paradise killer just now and it sounded like in paradise killer moving around the game world and interacting with it was a large part of that game uh not the yeah. ca- not the it case was, in was, kentucky route zero in a way similarly inconsequential but it mm. was mean in the meantime it a, was fun to do okay and, and, and a large zero, a large part of the gameplay is, maybe it, um in in which one paradise killer no it's really just a means to getting around well i just mean like if you if you if you looked at a, a pie chart of the different activities you spent your time doing in paradise killer how big is the pie slice that says walking somewhere half okay so there you go yeah yeah um uh the oh i do want to say one thing about Paradise Killer that I didn't mention. I want to give it kudos for something. There's a sl- there's a slew in the last several years. There's a trend, and I understand the trend, of 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 open world indie games that do this thing where there's like not a lot of character 
characters in the game. Like, there's not a lot of stuff in the game. Like, remember Firewatch? And, and part of the way through Firewatch, I got the distinct and eerie feeling of being in an empty world. And it kind of wanted to give me an eerie feeling, but there was sort of like this bizarre otherness to how empty everything felt, which I understand to be specifically a budgetary thing and and not having someone to like do a, animations or whatever. And there's a lot of games like that. And Paradise Killer does a really good job of being one of those games and still having a world that feels like it's full of stuff and people. Anyway, last hmm. this is just a side note about Paradise Killer that you reminded me of by bringing it back up. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, but... So Kentucky Route Zero, so uh, so that's what is moving around in Kentucky Route Zero is largely like, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's not really important to, to the game, uh, but what what is the most interesting part of the game to me is the way the game handles dialogue. Um, mm. So it's, and it, it's hard to, hmm. So there's a lot of dialogue choices in the game. But it's not the kind of choice that you might be thinking of uh, in, you know, in a typical game, it's like you have agency over a character and the character has a choice to make. Um, Like your, it's like your choice is about acting through the character normally in a game. Whereas in Kentucky Route Zero, the choices are often about actually determining what the character is thinking at the time. Uh, which can end up being very different things. Or the the most interesting ones are when you have a group of characters all talking and you it, there will be like a break in the conversation and you will have an option of three different things that can be said, but they're all said by three different characters. So you kind of, you know, it's like you're, uh, it's like, um, it, it feels like the story of the game is kind of like co-authored by you um, more mm. than in other games. Which I think and is it interesting. strikes me, and it, I guess it hits in different ways at different times, and it's not to say that the way it's done isn't important. I think the way that it's done is important, but um, it it sometimes feels like it doesn't matter what is said because all of the thoughts occur within the people, whether mm-hmm. you choose the to say it or not. Um, and yeah, though, and that is, is important, but the, the flip side of it is that it's showing you what everyone's thinking, whether or not that's the path you choose right. to say. Right. You're, you you're, know, yeah, you, you see what everyone's thinking and you get to choose who says what, um, and, and sometimes in those conversations, like the dialogue trees end up being different for different situations so some conversations are a conversation where you have the opportunity to let everyone say their piece if you want them to and then other times if you don't choose the ezra line and you choose the shannon line you don't get to you don't get to see what happens when ezra says that thing because it's just kind of gone uh but what i was saying uh my example of sometimes you are choosing what the character is thinking and maybe maybe this is a kind of choice that went away as the the game went on because the game the like if you if you look at the if you read like the original pitch vision for this game it's like very different from what it ended up being so it definitely changed a lot over the course of development but for example like the very first choice you make um in the game or maybe the second whatever is like uh Conway shows up at that gas station talks to the attendant and you have the option of saying uh, oh, I've been dry. I've been looking all evening for five dogwood drive, and I just want to finish my delivery. Or you can say, "I'm looking for five dogwood drive, but I'd rather just watch the sunset." Like you decide, like is Conway just kind of like, uh, is, is Conway just um, tunnel vision on finishing his delivery, or is Conway is Conway looking to just relax and and like have a good think for a minute? which I think are two very different vibes that you could create in that moment. Yeah. Um, Cause the first time, the first time I played, I was like, I was kind of trying to decide like, no, like Conway, you know, Conway's like a head down kind of guy. He's not looking to like watch the sunset when he has a job to do. Like he just wants to finish the thing. Cause he's got a thing that needs doing. Yeah. 
Well, and this ends up this ends up being, I think, uh, one of the tensions in the game. One of the honestly, the few the few flaws that I have with this game is this sort of like. Um, this, this, this part of it where the game decides later, like how much of what you're saying counts, um, because all through acts one to three, um, you will occasionally get dialogue to be like Conway was an alcoholic Mm -hmm. and, you know, he's having trouble with um like wanting to drink and like that's an option that you can pick you can choose to have right. conway want to continue drinking alcohol um and i basically was not interested in that as a as a plot line right um so i never picked those i always picked the other one whatever whenever that mm-hmm. came up it happened like multiple times like enough for me to notice that they were giving me the option to engage with uh, Conway's alcoholism as a storyline versus not do that. Yeah. Um, what and what then I... in Act Four? No, so yeah, go ahead. And then in Act Four, they sort of pull the rug out and go. This is actually a going to be a major thing. You can decline yeah. to you can decline to participate here, but we're still just going to do it, and that's going to be like kind of what the rest of this act is going to yeah. be about. And and that's why um, that's why I say that it's kind of like co-authoring that's happening with those choices. Cause yeah. So like I, I kind of did the same thing uh, with the alcoholism. I kind of avoided it and then it kind of came back, but I think for me it, it, yeah. So, so it's interesting cause sometimes you have these, these choices where, you know um, in a moment, you know, someone will ask a, uh, say Conway a question and Conway, your options for Conway are like, does he bring up his past uh, problems with drinking or does he say something else and i think yeah in those moments it it for me usually it didn't usually feel like oh conway is thinking both of those things or i guess like my previous example sometimes it's clear from the two options like you can't be thinking both of these at once so it is like you're choosing like what like you you are like making an affirmative choice in like the narrative of the game like what is this character right. thinking at this moment and and yeah. then yeah like you said it can cause that clash um when Which tracks because sometimes you're thinking about a lot of things in an hour and when right. especially when you're not in a conversation and sometimes you have a thought like a reaction like someone like a reflex someone hitting your knee you don't have time to think mm. two different things um i think um, for me some of the the um it's interesting because an example in my head of one of my most favorite um, the moments of the game, or, or at least my, because I, 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 this was just a moment based on what was going on in my head and, and wouldn't necessarily be the same for everyone. Um, but what I, what I think is interesting about those choices where you can choose what to bring up and what to not bring up is it does kind of, it gives you that little authorship over it. And then like, so this alcohol fit is a, pops up um i think at the end of act three and then like at the start uh, of act it's like the beginning of act four actually pretty maybe i'm wrong i could be wrong uh, but i'm pretty sure it's the end of act it's beginning of act four yeah it, whatever it's end of act three and beginning of act four are pretty close to each other anyway but um like it so there's like this flashback where conway is talking to lisette and it was fun because there kept being these dialogue options. Like, you know, it's common in Kentucky Route Zero. You'll get two dialogue options and like one will just feel more positive than the other. And it's kind of a question like, what do you want to say in this moment? Something kind of dreary or something slightly more positive? And what was fun about that moment was like, I, I like two times in a row picked the more positive option. Uh, even though like in the negative option, it was kind of vague because like I, it wasn't really clear what, the negative options we're talking about but like i i kind of had some guesses about where it was going but i was kind of interested like in those moments i was sort of like no i don't want to bring the conversation in that direction i want to see if it'll go in this other direction uh and it so it creates this moment where it's like i'm avoiding something i'm avoiding talking about something but as the player i'm not even sure what i'm avoiding talking about 
And then it kind of like the conversation will come back around again and I'll be like, okay, let's, yeah, it like, I, I, I think that's a good point. Maybe I think I'm not, that's like the thing that I, that I had to come to terms with, with the game because actually I was so annoyed with the plot turn in act four that I stopped playing for like oh, four months. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. Uh, so I, but I could, it is true that the thing you have to come to terms with, with the game is that exact thing of like like yeah you were avoiding talking about something right. in the yeah. same way that i thought that i was choosing to not engage with right. the alcoholism plot line but actually the way that the game interprets that is conway not engaging with right it. though and and the alcoholism thing comes back because it becomes a major plot point but there are other smaller th- tons and tons of smaller yeah. things that don't come back that you know, that are typically more obvious. To that, them. Yeah, the, those things don't come back, and so those are moments that you essentially had a hundred percent authorship over. But I think what's interesting me to me about blah, authorship uh, of the text, but not authorship over the character's feelings. I think I think sometimes I think I think what is so interesting to me about Kentucky Route Zero is that more than many other games I've played. It feels unclear in those moments. Like it, it's almost like there's a push and pull between like your authorship and the game's authorship, and kind of just like in Kentucky Route Zero, how there's often scenarios where you're not quite sure what parts are real and what parts aren't. It's like in Kentucky Route Zero, as you're playing through it, like you're making all these choices constantly, but you don't know if any of them matter or which ones matter, which ones will come up again and which ones won't. So it, it feels like this. You're just like, you're kind of like in the dark and feeling around in this story and kind of just picking like what options feel the feel right to you in the moment or like how, how do you want to try to nudge this, nudge the the story or characters in a certain direction and how far will the game let you do that before it decides like, no, actually Conway's alcoholism is important or whatever, you know, like you not talking about the alcoholism turned out to be Conway just wasn't talking about it, but there are smaller choices, like I mentioned, where you know, if the alcoholism didn't come back up, then that would have been something that you essentially had total control over in the story. Um, yeah. So now well, after, the, after playing... The other part of this... Oh, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, sorry. Did you have something... You kind of cut out. I thought you were done. Uh, I was just going to say, like, after, after all this, I think what's really interesting about Kentucky Route Zero is um, is I, I remember a lot of moments from the story, but I don't remember... Like, I don't remember which things were triggered by choices I made. And I don't right. like after you play Kentucky Route Zero, you can there's stuff you can totally miss, and there's some stuff that you won't miss. But I have no idea which things those are. Like I have ideas, like uh, yeah. this probably happens to everyone, but I don't know which things it is, which is interesting. Yeah. Uh, the thing I was going to say was that um, is that the Conway thing in Act Four it it leads it ties ties this sort of um vibe of like what is what is what is the nature of the dialogue choices and how much of these are the 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 internalities of the character uh regardless of what you choose to say and how much is a choice mm. as a player that you're making it ties into back into the um more concrete aspects of the the plot of the the debt and the control the external control that you have Whoa. that forces have over you because it isn't actually due to or at least mostly not due to um Conway's deficiencies in dealing individually with his alcoholism mm. that this plot line kind of explodes uh, and becomes a real source of um right uh tension and momentum in the plot it's because of those external forces mm-hmm. that con- that basically control his options control his ability to choose to not not drink alcohol and become you know <laughs> Well, <laughs> that was gonna be cut out. I'm gonna have to cut that out now. Why? You can't say that. 
Well, now you've made a thing of it. Oh, I knew that was going to be the next thing you said. It's, well, right. Anyway, you can cut. You can cut it out. It's fine. Um. So um, all all of the I, all of the magical realism and the dialogue choices and all this stuff, it it's all this lens um, through which we view this story that is largely like, yeah, like this, uh, like I don't know, like elegy for rural Kentucky or something. Um, it it's yeah, it's a lot of. Um, I don't really understand magical realism as a genre. It's not something I've read. I don't know the tropes. Me neither. Um, and so there you go. Yeah. So I guess don't. I guess don't take us seriously if we say magical realism because we don't know what it means. Uh, it means a bunch of the weird stuff going on in Kentucky Route Zero. You know. You sure. Yeah. Let's uh, let's look it up. Let's magical realism. Every time, yeah. I mean, I I don't know a lot about magical realism, but I just I know which things are because I've heard people be like, it is, and I and I look at those things I and I go, people. yeah, I see the commonalities between those things. Magical realism, also known as a magical realism. Wait, what? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Magic realism, also oh, known okay. as magical realism or Got marvelous it. realism is a style of fiction and literary genre that paints a realistic view of the modern world while also adding magical elements. Magical realism, perhaps the most common term, often refers to literature in particular, with magical or supernatural phenomena presented in an otherwise real world or mundane setting, commonly found in novels and dramatic performances. This is interesting. Including oh, sorry. What's that? You can, you can keep going. Despite including certain magical elements, it is generally considered to be a different genre from fantasy because magical realism uses a substantial amount of realistic detail and employs magical elements to make a point about reality, while fantasy stories are often separated from reality. Magic realism is often seen as an amalgamation of real and magical elements that produces a more inclusive writing form than either literary realism or fantasy. So I think that fits. There you go. That, that seems and like it fits. What's it? Are you going to disagree with me? No, no, no. I, I think what's interesting okay. is like this definition you've just read was like my previous understanding of magical realism, which is like basically a story where magic stuff happens in the real world and people go, wait, but that's not, but this is the real world and we don't have magic. And like, that's what right. magical realism is. And this is the first paragraph of Wikipedia. It is the bargain bin definition All of right. magical realism. Yeah, we don't have, we don't need to get into it because I don't even care about magical realism. It's fine. Uh, um, but, but like but you I, said, this was your previous, did you have a, do you have a new, more nuanced understanding? I did not, what you just said, I did not take that from this definition, but I can see how you, how you would. Oh, okay. Well. Uh, I think the so on on Waypoint uh, a a touchstone they gave for magical realism is like the early parts of Twin Peaks. Does sure. that do anything Tot for I you? I totally see. The, honestly, that is what that's what I took when I while I was reading this, I was thinking that. So that makes total sense. There you go. Um, and, but so <laughs> that's all to say <laughs> that um. Uh, the, the story is largely about, um, it's like a lot of meditations work, on debt. Yeah. Work, debt. Death. Yes. Um, sickness, loss of control. It's, it's um, a, it's a, it's a, it, it's, I'll say this. It's, it's even more relevant now than when they started writing it seven years ago. Yeah. Lives made lives made difficult or even um uh, uh uh meaning stolen from lives by work and by money and corporations um, um and 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 that is that's some of the sharpest um and and most acute themes and moments in in there there's God. also a, oh I, I have to look up a quote i have to look oh, up okay. do you remember the memorial on the um on the on the raft ride to the like the relay station, I don't know what any of that you just said was. It's at the end of near the end of Act Four. Oh. Shannon and Conway are on a raft ride. Okay, to through the Bat Sanctuary. 
Okay, And gotcha. I thought that that was some of the best shit in the whole game in terms of, like, a, a concrete and sharp illustration and juxtaposition of themes for me. Memorial... I can I still have that fucking guy's voice in my head from the from the call in line. He's like, "We're here. You've reached here and there along the echo." I fucking love that guy. I did that I, on the phone. I yeah, I, did, I didn't realize phone. it was really on the phone until later. Uh, but you did. They give you. There's another number you can get from that, and I did call that one on my phone. Um. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's not all of it. Let me see if I can get all of it. I, I, I do want to read this out because I think All it's right. so good. Well, you, you um, get that. I'll talk a little bit more. Um, God, I wish I was, you know, for somebody who's like ostensibly all of their living comes from talking. I feel so bad at it, especially when it's time to be like, hey, let me let me talk about this complicated and nuanced game. It is it is me, extremely extremely difficult game to talk about. I mean, it is it is bursting with. I know, in and it's <laughs> cho- this baby's chock full of meaning. This baby's chock full of meaning. Maybe this gets to the reason why I just want to talk while I play the game because I'm like playing Kentucky Route Zero and I have a million things to say about. It. I'm going to say this and this and this and this and this, and now we're on the podcast and I'm just like. Ah, uh, there's uh, magical realism in it, and capitalism in the end. Um, okay, I found I found the text of this. All right, go ahead. <clears throat> so, early in the game, you uh, meet Shannon, who is the um, is a hobbyist electrician. Um, professional sis, sis, pro, okay yeah no she works at, like a TV repair place right yeah okay she's a professional electrician si, she is the sister of a MacGuffin character right um, she her parents died in a mine yes they were miners in, York, in a company town mine in a company town mine and hours and hours and years of game of uh, of hours and hours of gameplay and years of waiting later they bring there's a you find a memorial to this mine uh, on a river and you don't you feel like this a, is too much to reveal no i oh, don't think okay. this is too much to reveal all right uh and so the sign i just the, the writing of this sign and then the thing that comes after i think is just a great illustration of what like the what is at the heart of the game at least mm-hmm <clears throat> uh so you you find you find this wooden this sort of roughly made wooden thing covered covered in and surrounded by mining helmets mm. and there's a sign and on the sign it says we claim these helmets and the names of folks who wore them and we place them here in their memory but also as a spit in the greedy green eye of that power company who bought up our old mine and traded our brothers and sisters safety for a little more yield but only yielded 28 good men and women dead when the walls collapsed and the tunnels filled with water their lungs were black but now they're washed clean and full of water too and swept through uh swept through hidden tunnels into some awful cave we will never find. And so we guess that the water buried them for us. So let this here be the marker for their grave. And if any son of a bitch from that power company wants to take back these helmets as company property, just you try it and see what will happen. Uh, And Conway recognizes the mine is the mine that they were in in act one Mm -hmm. and goes, do you think whoever wrote this is still that angry? And Shannon, whose parents died in this mine, said, "I don't think you can ever forget anger like that. At least in at least in mine." Right. I was gonna say she yes. Say, Technically, she did say that in both of our games, but there is a different thing you can say instead. There is another option. She says, "Sure, angry, mainly just hurt," which I think is also a fair thing to say. But yeah. I wanted to say the first thing. And yeah, then I, I the think next- so. It's real quick. So interesting about uh, these choices is when I look back on them. Most often, more very like by far more often, I can only remember the choices I made and not the choices I left behind, which I think is really interesting. Mm. Um, and so right after that, you go into the bat sanctuary, and I think that that sign 
was really was really emotional for and me now, and powerful. And it was. And and the reason I was like, is this not too much to reveal? It's just because like that's one of the sharpest and most powerful moments of writing in the game. I I feel like it's. You don't think Gosh, it's important? It's been out for so long. Oh, that's oh, right. God. It's been out for four years. Sorry. Well, but yeah. you know, Kentucky the game just. I get it. I, I just get played it. it. We but both at just this, played but it. At this point, if you're if you're that invested, you would have stopped. You would have chosen to stop listening here and go play the game. I think. I don't think we need to warn people about that. And, okay. and there's plenty of stuff in the game that is that is like that. Um, I happen nothing's to think that, that good that though. A, that is such a powerful declaration. It yeah. stands. But I think, but then the the real cherry on the top of this is that the next place that you go is this bat sanctuary, where you've. I mean, this at this point we're hours and hours into the game, and like we have witnessed a wide breadth of human suffering that mm. that is caused by very specific forces, and in addition to very specific forces. Sort of like the general melancholia of of living life and how sad life is, mm-hmm. um, but but with with the added point that like maybe something maybe it's maybe that it's maybe it's only because this is caused to yeah. us that this is how life there, feels. There are like life life is so hard, but there are material forces that are doing it on purpose. That we beyond can't us. That, beyond us that we cannot affect, but and that that our lives would be better if they were not doing that to us. And so you head into this bat sanctuary, and so you're in an underground river system is mm-hmm. where this takes place. So this is a, you're in a river underground. Um, it's very confusing and impossible. I think um, this but, is not how the world works uh, in real life. I mean. You can definitely have rivers underground. It, you can, but can you row a boat through them? Well, we're on the zero, baby. We're on the zero. That's the difference. Yeah, uh, we're we're on Echo. We're on, you're echo on Echo. River? We're on Echo River, which, which is the the river equivalent of the zero. Yeah, which is it's like again, none of this is clear. It's all muddy. It seems like more extant than the zero. But it, in another it way, does. just feels like an extension of the zero for Act Four. Um. So, so you head into this bat sanctuary, and they have created this like they call it the uh, Kentuckiana River Bat Hibernaculum and <laughs> Sanctuary. That's what uh-huh. it's called, the Kentuckiana River Bat Hibernaculum and Sanctuary, and. There's this Kentucky river bat who some th- th- thoughtful environmentalists or someone or have started what I can only assume as a nonprofit to take care of this bat who's being affected by mm. a disease called like white nose syndrome, which yes. is a fungal infection that these bats get. And so they have they have created this environment where it is extremely unlikely that a bat in here could get this infection to the point where they have genetically engineered moths, a pseudo moths, they call them pseudo moths, uh, that they have named the little gray, nothing moth. They're, uh, uh, antibacterial, uh, uh, like sterile, um, because they've, uh, they've genetically engineered a moth that can't carry this disease that all these bats are getting. Right. Right. And so they re- replaced the bat's food source with this um, little gray nothing moth, and which I think is a great name. Um, and they, in turn, capture and kill the equivalent amount of naturally born moths that the bats that the bats would eat right. were they eating real moths. And then, in order to not to even further not so that the so that the normal moth population does not explode. Like exactly. they're trying to make up for the removal of the bats from this ecosystem, right? And then and and so then are also collecting the guano, the bat droppings that f- would regularly fertilize the environment where the bats would hunt. Mm-hmm. They collect it from the hibernaculum and sanctuary, and um, and b- manually distribute it along where their natural hunting grounds would be in an effort to to 
protect the bats without disrupting the natural ecosystem otherwise. Mm. And the amount of effort and mm -hmm. money and care put into these stupid fucking bats <laughs> next to what is happening to the people who live in this world, I think is just an unbelievable um, and true to life display, despite taking place in this obviously uh, uh, mm. impossible location is such an, a real display of what, what money uh, what money and what and like nonprofits will yeah give no it's you and I, I think American the, politics yeah. specifically and it's it's funny because the the part you glossed over was the only takeaway that I had really from that moment it because you're, you're right I that was very it's a very sharp read on that moment that I I guess was not good enough to to kind of notice at the time my really only takeaway from that was like that this was a disease being caused. I think it was like, it was a disease being caused by humans, but probably by way of the, this power company, I think like, I just remember it being that like, Oh, these, you know, what was I thinking? I don't know. I had to barrel through Act Four. Act Four was tough for me to get through. But <laughs> act it, Four is the longest act it, too. It is funny though that yeah, it's the longest act. Uh, well, I I say I had to barrel through it. I mean, I, I you know, I I was it's hard to barrel through this game. Yeah, because it, it's just reading. Um, you had to play it a lot in a row. Is I had, what you had, to, I had do. to. Yeah, I get actually. It's not even really true that I did that. Kentucky Route Zero was a very difficult game for me to play. Um, because it's, it's most because it's mostly just reading, and my brain just doesn't like doing that. It really wants to stop anytime I start doing it, and so like, you know, I wish I hadn't crammed this game in seven days before game of the year. But quite frankly, if we didn't do game of the year, I'm sure I never would have gotten to act two, like, or I w I never would have gotten out of act two. I I did get there, um. But that's my brain. That's my brain, and the problem my brain has. Um, I feel that I have the I have that problem with books. Reading in games is pretty much fine for me, but with books, it's like, oh my god. Yeah, but yeah, no, that's a, a total great read on the bat thing, right? Yeah, the the money and effort that is spent on protecting these bats, uh, pr protecting these bats, and protecting the bats ecosystem from the damage that's being done to it by the power company meanwhile without directly addressing without the power direct company right without directly addressing any of the reason for why this is happening uh meanwhile no such efforts or 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 money is being spent on helping or protecting any of the people or any of the people's habitats that are being destroyed by this company uh yeah um Hmm. So it, it's a um, lot of stuff like that. I and I, I think what is in a lot of this game is a lot of uh, choir. That is a loud moment for me. Like reading mm -hmm. the sign and then sh then being shown the bat thing. This is a very quiet game a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's and that's part of why I felt okay reading that sign was because like it is really sharp, but it's also atypical for the game, which is which is like a very somber and quiet game. Yes. And it, does a lot with that and is and it is best in its quiet moments too. And and sorry, when you're when you're you're talking about this memorial to the miners that you read? Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, that's the that that I consider a an atypical la, an atypically right. and, loud moment. And that and that was why I was kind of taken aback that you wanted to cuz it's like, yeah, it's not a spoiler. It's not it's just a sign. But it's like to me, it's almost like a spoiler because it's one of the times in which the writing of the game is the most direct about what it's about. Um, yeah. Uh, but so it's so a lot of so that is when it gets very direct about what it's about, and then a, a lot of the rest of the game is it's a lot of people trying to live their lives and just talking. And as you go through it, I bet you'll hear a lot of thoughts and perspectives. And, and things that you're very used to seeing living in a capitalist society. And it's just kind of stuff that's just like constantly droning on in the background that we often seem to be like ignoring when, um, you know, like the, the average American who just like is fed the line that capitalism is great uh, their whole life. And 
it's, it's so it's like that's the concept they have of capitalism in their head but meanwhile they've lived a life full of nothing but people you know losing their houses because of debt and you know d- d- whole towns collapsing because of factories closing and all of these things it's a, like a lot of these small moments is in Kentucky Route 0 it's a lot of people saying you know it's just like a lot of really mundane tragedies that right. when you take it as a whole and really look at it you're like oh th- our whole world is fucked um but in like Kentucky Route 0 is really it's good essentially, at essentially this it's, game paints um, almost like it, i mean it's almost like an apocalypse uh, in in the in the way that people are in the way in the way that people can't find a place um like this is a game that mm. there's almost not a single second where you see people who have a place that is stable maybe maybe yeah. no second there might be no time in this game where you see someone who feels comfortable um, right yeah and, and, it's and sort of like like this is a world created by a, a, an economy that functions as a, as a, a basically an apocalypse a personal uh like apocalypse yeah and i hmm yeah, it, it, it's a game that ruminates a lot on decline and the different ways we think of that and the different ways that they happen. Um, I think we could probably move on because I think we're just in danger of continuing to both say the same things over and over again and then to just describe more and more of the game until there's less and less of it left. Uh, yeah, I, so mean, I, 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 I have. I also oh. I, I do want to say one more thing, which is that like I think that just beyond what the game is about and what the like the text says like literally what the text is saying um is a game that is like full of really surprising and engaging presentations of a game like i've never seen a game that has this many different ways of showing you the the game Mm. um there's top down there's like uh like uh well, there's like a vector graphic sometimes there's yes. like 3d shit there's oh. 2d shit sometimes you're d- okay uh, you're one character or another and it does the the fifth the fifth act had this really surprising thing where you play as a character i won't spoil that you That's sure won't you say you can't because i'll cut it out i'll, I'll but, slice it out with my hands if you try to spoil you that pl- you play you play kind of like a panorama of like you are the cent- the focal point like the camera is the focal point of this town and you play by encircling it and as you encircle it like you talk or you listen and scenes change um and it, it was just absolutely stunning yeah it um, it, it was so I guess uh, maybe it's worth mentioning if you are the person that played the acts as they came out and have been waiting four years for act five, you might be quite surprised at what that act is and where it goes or more, more directly where it doesn't go. Um, But since I didn't wait four years, I just thought it was great. Uh, (laughs) uh, Definitely like, I don't think, I don't think this game makes it onto my top 10 list if act five was not nearly as good as it was um and and the interstitial before that uh, probably i forget even what it's called oh it's called um what the town of nothing or something the it's the people of nothing but it's the, the people of nothing yeah pueblo el pueblo donada um uh so that was that was my favorite part of the game pretty much and and act five was i thought a great follow-up to that um and yeah just a very interesting way of interfacing with a story and a place because yeah like you say largely the camera is anchored in the in the center of the town and it's kind of panning around and there's different people doing different things uh and you can basically listen in on the conversations or you know take part in their conversation however you want to describe it uh and you talk you do you do talking in that well i just mean like you as in like who are you 
when you're playing right, Kentucky yeah. Route Zero, whatever. Uh, right. And and interesting how essentially the way the Act Five handles like um, handles like advances in the story is that like your your camera has to keep panning around so then like once certain things are panned off of screen they will disappear and when you pan back that character might be in a different area or just doing something else um i think i think it could be possible that um like conversation moments will appear and then disappear and reappear like i think one time i saw yeah. shannon like in a certain place but i had someone else i wanted to go talk to and then when i came back shannon was gone but then i like 20 minutes later shannon was back in the same spot and i think she just had the same thing to say um, yeah there is one with me with ezra talking to one of the um people from uh the interstitial um and and I went, I, I was going to go, but I, I sort of wandered off off screen. And when I came back, they were gone. But I did, I did catch them in that same spot a couple minutes later. So, yeah. Um, and, and I, I guess, yeah. So my, in the sound recommend headphones. Um, I had, I had my headphones plugged right into my Xbox controller. That was a great way to do it. Um, there's and, just like a ton of, of aural information for you absolutely um, and i'm gonna go ahead and recommend that people listen to it however they want because i didn't use headphones i thought it was fine you don't what's the opposite of you don't know what you got till it's gone you don't know uh what, well i guess it would be uh you don't ignorance know what you're bliss. missing until you get it so ignorance is bliss that's what it is i don't i mean i think i think those are slightly different but I mean, that's that's what you wanted to say, right? You don't you don't know what you're missing until you get it. I guess that was kind of your point about the headphones, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, um, the the yeah. So the 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 sound is so good. The I I'm just like blown away at the different presentations that the game has to offer. Um, I think a lot of them feed directly into the game, like as a whole uh but even separate from that it is just like fascinating to play games in these different ways yeah it just it keeps things varied you know in a, in a story that is largely about reading stuff you do need change-ups to keep things interesting and yeah, i think kentucky even though Zero all does you're okay doing is that. even though all you're doing at any given time is like a, like clicking text and reading mm. it it still feels like you're doing a lot of different things because of the way that they yeah shake things up um, love the interstitials don't skip out on the interstitials well, yeah, um, you 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 can't. That would you, you literally shouldn't. cannot. I mean, no. you you. I guess. I mean, I didn't try, but I think you you might be able to skip parts of the game. Like, I don't think it makes you go through I don't it think in order to play anything. But that's just the TV mode because you yeah. if you you know played. It's like it's not going to make you play an act that you played before. You know, so yeah. you can play each um, act in a whatever order or any order, but don't play it through straight. Um. Uh wait, I do do play it through straight. Yeah, do play it through straight. Um I think I think one last example. I know I know I was like I don't want to give away too much, but I want to give an example of the story from uh Act 2 that I think uh I think it 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 um it highlights some of the really interesting perspectives that the writers find on on these things, you know, we're talking about, oh, these these forces outside of people and communities that affect them from without. Uh, I, I think a great example of this is in Act 2. You go to, um, you go to this, like, bureaucratic building that is in an old church. Um, and they say that the, the bureau claimed the church... Uh, and and kicked all the parishioners out. And of course, you know, they say, oh, we gave them a, a perfectly good replacement church and it's a um, storage locker in like a, in a self-storage facility, which of course that part of it is like almost comedic in like its depiction of capitalism, right? Of like moving a church congregation to a you store it or whatever. Um, but the, the little story they tell, because when you get there, nobody's there. There's only one person there. And and uh, and they're like, oh, are you here for the service? And they're like, well, no, we're 
trying to get to Dogwood Drive, but it kind of looks like you're the only person here. I don't see a congregation. And they kind of tell this story of like, oh, yeah, you know, when uh when the when the congregation first moved here, you know, it was just as many people. You barely couldn't even move in the hallways cuz everyone was packed in. But then, you know, people in the back couldn't really hear. It wasn't a great experience, so kind of like slowly less and less people came. And then once there weren't enough people, then the people that would do the do the services like the priests or whatever, like they just left behind recordings of their sermons so that we could just play them. And basically now nobody comes and I just play it every night as like a little ritual to myself or something. And I I thought that little story is like a great example of how you know, you look at that, you look at this this um, church community and you say like, oh, it, it just, you know, it died out. You know, just less and less people came and then there weren't enough people to sustain it. And so now it just doesn't exist anymore. When in reality, what happened was it was choked to death by the power company or by the bureau taking away their space and giving them a space that was wholly inadequate for the purpose. And I think I think that's a great thing to think about when we look at society is trying to remember, like, is this thing failing because it was doomed to fail or was it set up to fail? Um, and uh, it also when I, I had totally forgotten about this part because I played it over the summer or something, mm. or maybe even earlier, maybe it was probably even like the early spring. Um but pre it was pre pandemic, so yeah, it was probably like February that I play, played mm. this. Um, but uh, it it also could, this game is so good because that whole thing also plays exactly into um, their and I, I, I maybe we don't get into this because it's been so long on Kentucky Route Zero, uh, Kylie's ninth favorite game of the year. Um, uh, by eighth. It was actually eighth. eighth. Uh, okay. Um, well, um, so just, just, you know, it's, it, it's not, it's not super subtle. So just keep an eye out for the, the different ways that they use recordings, like the characters use recordings, mm. um, both in, and this is a, that's a big one for limits and demonstrations, I think. Um, but tapes and VHS and people and memories yeah. and like again back to the first thing that we talked about which was like the the line between real and not real uh what is a ghost the reco- the, 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 the <laughs> what is the, a ghost they, the, what is a go yeah they the the ways that they use recorded medium uh media in uh yeah it does i guess that yeah we kind of missed this game also does have a fascination with outdated technology it's a lot of like tube tvs and physical, oscilloscopes and analog yeah. technology yeah yeah um like pre-digital and and um, and of course i i i have to point this out um there you because well, there's 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 electricity in the wires and that is and, alive right and it's and it's it's it has it has valuable information on it, but the way that you get it to work is through Consolidated Power Company. Hmm. Uh, and I think I think it also is, you know, you're supposed to be thinking, because, you know, Shannon repairs television, so you're, maybe you're thinking about, like, uh, like the inevitability of entropy, like you can repair th- something for so long, but eventually it will just be broken, or, you know, or... Is that not true? Can is there a way to repair something indefinitely? Um, you know, I, I and what's interesting to me about that is like some some things, yes, but I would say like a television or an old computer is one of those things that is where that line is the blurriest. Like, can you repair a computer indefinitely, or will eventually it be broken? I don't know. Yeah. Um, That's Kentucky Route Zero. Uh, I think it's I think it's stellar. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to throw in one more thing, though, about the, the old computer stuff. There's there's tons of um, references to, like, I guess, and th- this is what I'm mostly getting from Waypoint, there's tons of references to, like, old philosophers and writers and um, uh, computer scientists and stuff. Um, and, of course, so there's a, there's a part in uh, Act 3 where you're basically, like, playing a text adventure on a, on an oscilloscope and i just uh the very first line i started flipping out because i realized it was like basically the exact same line of colossal cave adventure which was like the first 
adventure game ever made that was like made on mainframes in the 60s or whatever and i was just mm-hmm. like this is the thing i have to go to google right now to make sure that this is the right thing and it was and i i wished that it did a little bit more with that but it was just a little connection that i noticed and it was fun uh and then um, and, yeah. and later as as the story goes on i think it becomes more and more interested in thinking about uh peoples as uh, peoples as organisms and how uh you know the history of spaces and the the i guess i guess all of i guess all of the story is interested in this stuff the history of spaces and the different identities spaces can have and the identity that we imbue into those spaces and all this stuff it's very good act five is good act five five is is good it's very good God, the whole fucking thing is good um if i if i can close out my list by by the th- I, if I had to pick a through line here gonna, in, in different ways, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe Microsoft Flight Simulator doesn't count here. Maybe it does. In different, in different ways, all of these games were asking or getting me to think about at least who am I playing mm. in this. Like in Crusader Kings, it's like what is the who am I playing as like the the characters that I have control over change, but also like what is the nature of these people and the same is true for paradise killer with blaze ball it's like in what way is this even a game i'm watching a game am i playing a game too um and with kentucky route zero you it's there in a bunch of different ways i think is asking the same question so that's my that's my list through line this year great i love your list through line uh let's take a five minute break um, Got it. And then we'll come back for the through line of my list. Okay. And was uh, it games you played in 2020? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, certainly they all have that in common. Definitely, yeah. yes. You might have a through. I was, I was sarcastically doubting that you had a through line only because you have ten games and I barely had a list. What? No, I have a through line. Let me. Okay. I'll look at okay. the through line Great. right now. And yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. 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 Um. Hmm. Almost. Did, how was that? Was that entertaining for anybody? I liked it. I look at. Ice Cream Jones says it's okay. We're only five hours in. We're four hours yeah, in. Excuse, excuse four you. We're actually only four and a half hours in because you four forgot the you forgot in. that this was a run button stream. So of course it started half an hour late. Idiot. Yeah. Jerk. Dummy. All right. I'll be. We'll be back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 